Hi, I'm George Nori, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Our conversation with Bill Grabowski about his new book, Black Light, which, as I said at the beginning of the program, casts a pretty wide net in the paranormal spectrum, uh, looking for connections between a whole bunch of really weird stuff. When we come back, we'll hear from him about his tracking down some of the witnesses to the weirdness in Point Pleasant and what they had to say up close and personal. Bill, let's go back and talk a little bit about the witnesses, the eyewitnesses in Point Pleasant. You tracked down a bunch of them, didn't you? Yeah, I was. Um, I visited there five times. And most of the, the the first two visits, I was not with my wife, Leanne, um, because I didn't know her yet, but <laughs> um, I had a lot, of, um, a lot of interaction. And at the very first festival, for me anyway, the one that I, where I met Keel, the one thing I noticed right away was that the town was divided about how they reacted to the festival. At this point, it was only the second event and um that was the first thing i asked people so what do you think of this festival in your town and it was either you know i'm here to to get some food and watch people but regarding mothman and all that uh bs i'm not interested in it it's it's just awful and there were a lot of a lot of religious type people who were saying well it was it was a a demonic visitation and the bridge collapsing proved that it was a punishment. And on the other hand, you had the people who were absolutely overjoyed to have this festival there and, and have some some positive attention to the town. Um, and then I, I started to ask my individually geared questions. Um, I, I started off with people who were, who were a lot older looking, because obviously it was a, at this time it was 2003. With you know, well, just just wondering. I'm 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 here in town, and I want I wondered if you've seen anything during the 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 two year span of the the phenomenon. And I would say out of I probably spoke to I, it was at least 50 people. Out of those 50, probably 40 at least said they had seen UFOs out near. Mostly near the, the TNT area, which was seven miles north of town, but also in town. And I was also surprised to hear there were a lot of daylight sightings, which are harder to figure out. And, and most of those were described as the uh, your, your '60s model silver saucer-shaped craft. There were there were a few differences, though. Uh, one was described as a, a rectangular, very long object that went over someone's backyard in this was this was before the Mothman sighting um, but yeah the town was divided and over the years it seemed to become more accepting and um, of course then by then it was attracting international visitors there were news teams there from Japan um, Germany and now it, now it's even bigger <laughs> Do you have, uh, though, you have experiences with witnesses who are still frightened to this day, uh, some of those yes. who have seen the Mothman himself? Yeah, so, some of them I, I spoke to. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of people who said they saw the Mothman entity, but the few who said they did, you know, when someone's looking you in the face, it's hard to say, well, you know, I think you're full of it, um, which in a few cases I was certain but not not in the others where the the way it was described was was so uh the descriptions were so flat you know I, I was taking out my garbage and I saw what I thought was an owl and went into the woods and saw that it wasn't an owl this was in the TNT area cuz there are there are actual homes there they're scattered but it's it's so isolated 
But anyhow, most of the the reports I heard of the actual sightings of the Mothman entity came came from that area. And also, there were a few who said they were they were driving to there was a drive-in theater at the time across the river in Gala Police, Ohio. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, actually, the Silver Bridge used to lead right over there, and they they had seen it on the way to a drive-in theater uh, in flight. So uh, back to your idea, you had mentioned briefly that you thought one idea that you explore in the book is that um, maybe this is uh, some, uh, there were some incident reports, something, people saw something like a mothman, other people saw a UFO, someone in the government thought, aha, this is a great place to test out X, whether it's MK Ultra or pulling their chain or whatever the program would be called. Uh, what is your evidence for that? What do you... What 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 uh, leads you to the conclusion? At least some of this was was humans messing around. Well, the first thing was just the where Point Pleasant is located. Uh, it's within 200 miles of three Air Force bases: Wright, Patterson, and Dayton, um, Lockbourne, which I think now is called Rickenbacker Airfield, outside of Columbus, Ohio, and then Oakdale, which is south. <clears throat> excuse me, southwest of Pittsburgh. So that, that kind of rings a bell right there for aerial activity, especially Wright-Patterson being so close and known for, you know, uh, basically a, a hive of exper- aerial experiment, experimentation. And also the, uh, the Ohio River access, so they had easy air access, easy water access. And some of the early reports about men in black, for one thing. Um, it wasn't mentioned in Keel's book, and I'm not sure he knew it or not, but he probably did. A lot of insurance offices were visited by men in black, and I found out that insurance offices often have blueprints for local companies. They had blueprints for the, uh, the uh, nuclear power plant that was going up in Point Pleasant. And it seems that given this was the Cold War, Some of these men in black may have been spies who wanted to look or at least discredit people who who reported them, and and hence their bizarre behavior and their stuttering and acting like they're drunk. And, um, yeah, the whole whole thing about where the men in black visited and what was available there, that was kind of a red flag to, you know, just flat-out human involvement. And, of, of course... There are a lot of factories around Point Pleasant still today that produced um, exotic ceramics, um, metal, and other things used in the defense industry. So as far as the possibility for spying and espionage, it was wide open. And if it's and, some uh, outgrowth of MK Ultra, as you're, you're, you postulate, I mean, you, you don't prove it, but you postulate it and uh, suggest it might be possible, what would be the purpose of that, just to see if they could do it? if it's possible to do, um, I guess I would call it mythological engineering, to see the effects on people. And again, I think it started with actual so-called paranormal phenomena with with the Mothman sightings, and then could have been further exploited. And another thing is Point Pleasant, excuse me, is also not very far from from the intelligence infrastructure in Washington, D.C. and in Alexandria, Virginia, not very far at all. You know, Nick Redfern, who's our, our Nick Redfern's our guest in next hour. He had produced, a, came up with a document, a Rand Corporation document, where they studied it on behalf of the Air Force. The idea of um, mythological creatures creating sort of a mythology just to just to see if they can get away with it, manipulate the public, public opinion, public mood. Yes, yeah. Uh, also, uh, sociological engineering, because there were there was talk of it could have been in the same study. Um, about trying to broadcast, not broadcast, cast uh, an image of Jesus on the clouds. They, were, they wanted to use this over Cuba to uh, basically freak out people, because obviously a lot of uh, Catholics on, the, on Cuba, or in Cuba rather, that, that, that was mentioned. Um, I, can't, I, think the name, I think the actual instrument is called a mitralux, 
which casts an immensely powerful beam and basically any image you want, which it sounds almost laughable, but you never know. If, if people are terrified, uh, the perceptions are heightened and emotions take over and they can color things, they can project things onto it, which may have very well have happened in, in some of the entity sightings of Mothman and Thunderbirds. But as you say, that does not explain all of it. It certainly didn't explain it for Keel, who, uh, no. it, you know, you, you know, a lot of people would have classified him as a ufologist at points in his career. He, I think he referred to himself as a demonologist. I think you mentioned that in the book. I yes, mean, is that is that a literal sort of a way? Is that his explanation for paranormal in general is that it's demonic? Well, like a lot of the things Keel said, um, I think there was a lot more metaphor involved and not so much literalism, but in, in his worst moments when he was besieged with these phone calls, and uh, a lot of which were threatening, um, he, he said there is definitely a demonic element in how the phenomena affects you. If you're, once you step into the link, you're, you're part of it, and it, it, there can be a, reflect, a reflexive effect where things come back on you. Like for instance, he would ask a so-called entity, a question, uh, a phone, a phone voice. And a lot of the times he was convinced he was receiving these phone calls from someone in, in like a post-hypnotic state because often they would say, hey, so-and-so is standing here right next to me. Like in the movie where, where uh, oh gosh, where Gordon's, Gordon Smallwin's character, played by Will Patton, says, I have injured colds right here with me on the phone. Right. And they they would make claims, and then Keel thought that he was going to lose his mind because some of the things they said to him came true, or they they just knew details that that would be very difficult to know unless you were in someone's mind. And also, a lot of there were incidents in Point Pleasant and nearby with people hearing voices, and there there were there were tests of microwave called microwave hearing in the even in the late 50s about how to broadcast a voice into someone's head uh, either for military purposes to give direction or to drive people mad so that, there is some outside uh, documentation on these things well, you know what appealed to me uh, about Keel's central sort of message is that he looked at the UFO um, mystery and and saw beyond just nuts and bolts saucers with the prevalent uh, view at the, then and maybe even now is it extraterrestrials these are beings from other planets visiting us in craft and he saw it as something else that uh, that maybe this goes a lot beyond just just something as simple as that which valet Jacques valet is uh, has written extensively about it and and tying into a lot of other kind of mysteries uh, other kinds of creatures, that it seems to be some sort of a grand design, um, sort of almost like a, a play or a theater to mess with us, uh, either to educate us or to bring us along or just to really pull our chain. In your book, you say, there's a section where you go, in my estimation, Keel summed up what all others have missed. UFOs, paranormal phenomena are real. They exist and are a normal aspect of our environment. What they might actually be, we do not and probably cannot know. Is that, is that sum it up for you? Yes. Yeah, um, of course, the, the part about we may never know or we can't know, that is my personal opinion because I, look how long it's been studied. Um, and basically we come up with theories. Very little can be proven, um, but especially Jacques Vallée. I believe he actually states in those words, this, this is uh, stage management here. This is It's a control theater. system. Yeah, it's a and control it's system. It's theater, but it's frightening theater. And I believe he and Keel pretty much arrived. They pretty much both trashed the extraterrestrial hypothesis in the mid-60s. when they, After extensive research, they, they came to these conclusions. These cannot be, although Valet says the, the, the craft are physical but they're not real, which is hard to wrap your brain around. That's how can someone be physical? How can something be physical but not be real? And he, he has a more of a, a being French, there's more of a surrealistic angle to Valley's theories than to Keel. But Keel obviously 
I, I think they were, they were. I'm not going to say they were pals, but they were definitely on the same page regarding the, I guess you would call it the psychosocial theory. You know, I see these cases, some of the cases were coming up on an anniversary of the Hopkinsville uh, UFO case where these aliens uh, yes. showed up and... They, you know, it's like a shooting gallery. It is so preposterous on its face. Some of the stuff that happened at the Utah ranch, so ridiculous as to you don't even want to mention it. And then, you know, Point Pleasant and some of the experiences there, it is so preposterous and over the top that it's almost designed to look like no one could ever possibly believe this, to stretch the limits of our, of our credulity. Obviously, you've thought about that. Yes. Yeah, that was... When I first read about about men in black, for instance, over and over I'm seeing, okay, they have trouble breathing. They 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 make absurd statements. Uh, you know what what time is it? What is your time? And you know what what intelligent creatures do this? And and then reading Valley, where where he says, well, hey, maybe there is a reason for this absurd theater, whatever you want to call it. it it's meant to it's meant to cause cognitive dissonance it's meant it's meant to affect you emotionally with a powerful series of images that that are going to sink into you and you won't be able to forget them in order to program consciousness raise you know heighten evolution that was that was part of part of valley's series the control system hypothesis and i I think keel mostly agreed with that but not so much keel's take on it was far darker than Valley Keel was more about. I don't think they care about care about us at all. They they're just tampering because they can. It's not meant for any sort of transformative effect. Where, where Valley thought that you know possibly this this external whatever it is intelligence is actually trying to to have an effect on us. But the way we see it is, you know, it's a live wire. If you touch a live wire, you're going to get electrocuted. And the phenomenon can present itself that way and and may not even be hostile. We just, it's something beyond our, we, we have no model for it, how to interact with it. And so when we do, it comes out as either terrifying or, on the other hand, has a beneficial effect on people's lives. They come away from it with new talents, like uh, author Andy Colvin mentioned, uh, who, who lived near the Point Pleasant area. Yeah, I've had him on the program. It was a good right. guest, yeah. Okay probably numerous times, I think. And he mentioned that acquiring artistic skills after, after some uh, unusual experiences. Well, it just seems like in the big picture, you know, the, the positive me wants to say it's a learning curve of some sort. They're trying to tell us something. We're not quite smart enough to figure it out, but maybe we just need a little more info. The negative part of me says this is a diversion. This is a circus to keep us busy and occupied. It's uh, opium for the masses keeping us trying to figure out what the twinkly lights in the sky are while they, whoever they are, carry out whatever it is their agenda might be. Yeah, I, I would have to say I'm on that page as well um, because I still have I have the practical side and then I have the the, the fantastical side, the, the rights horror fiction. Um, and those two, those two feed each other. And then I, I try and back away from both and say, well, how do I feel about this as a human being? Um, I, I've been asked a few times, well, yeah, of course, you must be an atheist. Well, no, I'm not an atheist, because that's, that is like the ultimate cop-out to me. That's like just committing sui- spiritual suicide. We, we can't explain ourselves, so therefore you can't rule out an intelligence other than us. And we just I think we project our, our despair onto it, our hope onto it, and therefore it manifests... The way that it does now, and 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 now with uh, we have dominating influence of the internet, right? And our, our collective unconscious or subconscious is projecting new fears. We, we have the yeah, the it's the world. cosmic Rorschach test or something. Um, yeah, well, we, what a way to put it. That that yeah. is exactly it. You mentioned about the Will Patton character in the movie, the Mothman, uh, the, Bur- the Mothman prophecies, and I remember in the movie he committed suicide. Was there any suicide? Did any of the witnesses get so troubled that they took their own lives? Um, only, the only accounts I know of are those mentioned by Keel in Mothman prophecies, and I think he also mentions it in. Um, 
Disneyland of the gods, and he doesn't he doesn't name names, of course, but he said that there were suicides, and then of course Mary Heyer, the the Point Pleasant Register reporter, died sort of suspiciously in 19 I think it was 1970, and she either just made a phone call or just received one, and she was found dead in her home, um, and she was not that old. I think she was 54 or 55. I mentioned before that you uh, that the Keel had sometimes referred to himself as a demonologist, yes. uh, and does he mean that in a literal sense of there are demons that intervene in our lives, or did he mean it in a more generic sense that whatever this thing is, this intelligence that intervenes in our lives, that it is evil? I think he meant that whatever these entities are, that they they behave, that their effect on us is demo- can be demonic as in causing terror and, and, and seemingly uh, outright hostility, negative influence. Um, yeah, I don't think he meant, as, as in d- devils and Beelzebub, uh, in, in, in the literal way, but I, I think he, he meant it as possibly was meant even in the Bible, as these things are, are, are negative, and people call them certain things at certain times in, in our culture. And I promise this will be the last thing I ask, and then a lot of people are on the phones waiting to talk to you. But um, you mentioned in the book, which uh, I haven't mentioned it enough, but it's called Black Light. You should really check it out, folks. It is, uh, you really, Bill Grabowski really lays it out there. But um, uh, you mentioned that the government, uh, you, you speculate on the government, and I'm sort of in the same spot as you, that there is not going to be any big uh, revelation because chances are pretty good they don't know a whole lot more than the rest of us. That, that is precisely what I think, that um, it's been going on far too long uh, of pointing the finger at the government because, for one thing, it, it, it invests them with this, this godlike power that, given how bureaucracies function, um, it, it's impo- it, cannot, it cannot structurally work that way. And, and plus, if you think of the money that would be required for certain effects that, when you look back on them, what did they accomplish? They, they scared a lot of people. Yeah, they sure did. Um, and they probably learned a lot of things. Um, but as far as, you know, are they responsible for all of this? No. Uh, the problem now is we, ha- we have drone technology, which is really, really confusing the issue of, U- of UFOs. Yeah. And you've probably seen uh, as many videos as, as I have that oh, yeah. look look profoundly strange until you, you look at them again and then and then hear some report further reports that well that was actually a new kind of drone that has cameras on it that are being used by by people making films and if you see it at night it looks very strange i think because of drone technology because of cgi special effects technology available to anyone with a laptop that yeah. uh, ufo videos for all intents and purposes the the evident evidential value of them are way down Way down. Yeah, that, that's going even deeper and deeper into the hole. It's like every time I see one new evidence, I'm like, oh, brother, here we go. Just just like, you know, these images from Mars. But, yeah, as far as the, the UFO footage you're seeing on, on YouTube and elsewhere, some of which looks very, very convincing, you know, probably 99% of it is just somebody having a good time. And there are even apps for your, for your phone. Yeah, the government doesn't have to make it up anymore. Uh, the, oh. the people online are happy to do it and confuse yeah. it and muddy the waters all themselves. Yeah, it's an, it raises interesting possibilities that uh, the people who are in this kind of business are a lot better at it than we are at ours, and they can see a lot further down the road and and what the ultimate goal might be in preparing us for whatever might still be to come. And, and also, um, you know, no oversight on the budget for depending on what the project might be. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm watching this debate about you know Rand Paul is having a, a, a you know a monopolizing time on the floor of the Senate. I think yes. wants to draw attention to the extension of the Patriot Act and the NSA spying on all of us. And he's asking where is the outrage? And I'm I'm asking the same question: where is the outrage uh, yeah. about uh, authorizing them to spy on everyone? Why aren't we up in arms about that? How can we possibly think that it's um, you know that that this is a good thing? And um, and I, I it occurs to me that even if the Senate did not approve or the Congress did not vote to approve it, they could do it anyway, and there's not much we could do to stop them. 
Yeah, this has been proven. I mean, there's an excellent book by James Bamford. Um, it's about the NSA. It's called The Shadow Factory, where he goes into um, God, excruciating detail about how to get around these laws. And in a lot of cases, they just say, well, we need to, we need to know these things. We're going to do them anyway. And people, uh, the, the, the public has been very sheepish about accepting this in the guise of national security. Like everything is dangerous now and we'll protect you. But we need this information and we need to spy on you all the time. Well, I think this is an example of what Archer was sort of getting at in that last call, is they've been seeding this, this kind of imagery uh, for a long time. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Give us the authority to do whatever we want. Thank you very much. And then once you give up those rights, there's no going back. You think any of those experiences are military, intelligence, MK Ultra type stuff that people are led uh, to believe that they've I do. been? Yeah. I mean, have you got an example of a of one that what you would say definitely falls in that category? There, I I put one in the book that was. Um, I don't want to waste time flipping through it here, but anyhow, it was um, an individual who said that he was out camping and was hit by a strange light and and came to in a in a blue van that he was positive was a navy van um not navy blue as in naval and was was taken to just a normal facility somewhere and then was later later visited a psychiatrist who unfortunately used hypnotic regression which is not a reliable tool because it, it causes confabulation and right. had a had a full blown memory of of your typical abduction and examination and the trauma that causes quickly before we go um so in in essence there could be the government messing with us the government putting a lot of this stuff in our heads jacking us around pulling our chain but that doesn't account for all of it there really is something out there no it does not account for all but it can't possibly and and that's the as that's the aspect of the high strangeness where there's some things we may never figure out or we may in, in decades from now, but there, there is that, right. that small percentage that just cannot be explained through. All right, Bill Grabowski, thanks for coming on the show, and uh, we'll have you back. The book is called Black Light. It's an excellent read, folks. Check it out. Thanks, Bill. Broadcasting from the confines of an abandoned radio station in the secluded apartment building of high strangeness from the foothills of the Colorado Rockies. It's time for full disclosure of the topics they told us were off limits. I'm Connie Willis. This is Coast to Coast AM. Tonight, two men I call friends. Time to turn off the lights. Go over there now. Go ahead. Turn them off. Join me for another interesting evening of conversation, much needed education, and the chance that we might get a little closer to the truth of what lurks amongst us and what is beyond. Here's a friend. Our first guest is a friend of mine as well. And I haven't talked to him in a long time. Lives in Egypt. But it's funny because I end up talking about him all the time because people will, uh, as I interview them or just have a conversation or whatever the deal is, the case is when it comes to UFOs or even experiments into the unknown when it comes to ghost and mediumship as well and afterlife. And my friend's name comes up often because people will refer to his films or they'll say they they're not quite sure how to think. And I will suggest his films because they'll take you right over that hump. If you're on the fence, they take you right over the hump. And uh, I remember the first time I had met him, uh, who I'm about to bring up, and I remember saying to him that, hey, that film you made, that is the film that if people are on the fence, that's what makes you go to the side of belief. And it's just a huge film. That one was out of the blue out of the blue the uh, ufo film that you guys all know groundbreaking documentary of the ufo subject and widely considered one of the best ever made absolutely absolutely <laughs> absolutely so tim coleman is who i'm talking about he's a multi-award winning documentary filmmaker photographer great work journalist as well boy let me tell you he'll come back on you with some facts too and a bbb a bbc broadcaster excuse me <laughs> and you'll know that as soon as you hear his voice um he's best known for the out of the blue he also initiated and developed surviving death that's um a six-part series documentary on the evidence of life after death, and it is the uh, 
the second most popular program on Netflix in America. So that's huge. A lot of you guys have seen that and talked about that. He produced and directed one that everybody seems to be talking about recently. And it's been a while that he put it together. But uh, the afterlife investigations, the skull experiments that you guys go, oh, 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 yeah, the skull experiment. Amazing film. Amazing film. Uh, so that's also an award-winning documentary. And just unbelievable, unusual, compelling evidence ever for life after death. I know that uh, Bigelow was doing, you know, looking, right? He was working with Coast on that, or at least was a big part of being with Coast on that. And uh, I I just kept thinking about Tim's work. He also co-produced several other ones. We can talk about all those. I can go on and on. You know, we did the uh, the, the Crop Circle Quest for the Truth with Gazetki, and, and he's got many others. But let's bring him on because it is so nice to be able to do that. For the first time ever, I get to bring him on, Tim Coleman. Hey, Tim, welcome to Coast to Coast with me this time. Yay. How are you? Hey, Connie. So lovely to talk to you. Can you hear your lovely voice? <laughs> I'm so happy. You know, for years, it's always been like, hey, I'm going to interview you one day. And here we go. So it's quite a pleasure. And it's just great to hear your voice again. We got connected. It's been a couple of years. We didn't really get to talk, but uh, here we are. And yeah. uh it's nice. Yeah, it's really nice. It's what great. have you been up to, Mr. Egypt boy? Yeah, well, I kind of took a, a sort of, uh, you know, as the Netflix thing got off the ground and that got out in January, last January. Um, and as you say, it was very successful. Um, but the, sort of, um, I kind of took a back seat from directing uh, due to kind of, sort of some health problems. So I sort of went back to my first passion, which is photography. Because I was, you know, that's how I earned a living when I, when I started out. Um, and so I've been in, in Egypt. I've been coming to Egypt for, oh, God, since I was 22 years old, and I'm 63 now. So a long time, you know, I have a kind of deep spiritual, psychological connection with the country. So that was first to do with ancient Egypt. And then I got involved with the whole Sphinx thing, you know, the redating the Sphinx with John West. Um, and so we were oh. pals. Um, oh wow, that's was, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of the first journalist to write about that in England, um, <clears throat> and so I've just, you know, been exploring Egypt for a long time. And then I decided that, you know, I, I, I also made a film about the uh, Sufi festivals out here, which are pretty amazing. That was a long time ago. That was for Channel Four TV, and then that got fell through, so I shot it myself. Um, and then. Um, you know, I took a lot of photographs over the years. And then the last couple of years, I decided to really focus in on the photography and do a book called The Soul of Egypt, which is trying to capture the essence of this country that the, the tourists never really see. You know, you zip by on a tour bus and you'll see the pyramids and stuff and you go down to Luxor, but you won't see 90% of the really interesting stuff, which is really, how, you know, the sort of hidden side of Egypt. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Tim, your pictures are unbelievable. They are just so gorgeous. They really are. Thank you. I, Thank you've you always much. liked, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. You've always liked to do shots of people. Yes, I'm basically a portrait photographer. I'm more a kind of reportage street photographer. I like catching people unawares and sort of, you know, so you can sort of get a real sense of reality about that. Uh, yeah. Photography has moved more into sort of like people posing and staring vacuously into the camera. <laughs> yeah, that's modern. <laughs> I know, like you might as well, might as well be taking a kind of passport photo. But um, you know, that's, <laughs> exactly. that's not that, that's kind of not my scene. Um, so I do I do mainly travel and reportage. You know, I used to work when I was working as a journalist. I would all do do all my own photographs as well. So I have a background in sort of magazine photography as well. So. Amazing work. Yeah, yeah. And, you, you know, it's funny because I'll be out on my show or something like that myself, and, and I don't ever have pictures of myself doing it, and I need it for the website. So I'll ask people, can you take a picture of me when you see me doing some work or something like that? And they'll go, oh, yeah. And if they do remember, they'll they'll stand there, and they'll go, look up, <laughs> and they want me to smile. I'm like, no, 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 get me working, please. Don't. Mm, <laughs> I don't mm. want to smile, yeah, no, right? No posing. No posing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No posing. <laughs> you know, just just because this is in my mind right now, you know, the old photographs of people when they always just look straight and, you know, the older photographs, I don't know what year or decade they would be, but uh, 
th- th- it was mm. a long time ago when people got them, then they would they would never smile and they would just kind of look like. No. Why, why was that? Well, that was that, that was the Victorian age when you know the birth photography was began about eighteen thirties, and ah. um, you know it developed from there on. But you know the film was very 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 uh, poor, so in terms of its reaction to light, so what you had to do is you go into a studio. And the time, the, the shutter exposure would be like, you know, a half, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, right? Um, which means it's going to be blurry if you move. So they used to put these, you know, oh. family or something like that, and they'd have a metal clamp, and they'd clamp your head into it. <laughs> so, you, so you couldn't move, right? You were just like stuck in there. And that way the picture would be sharp. So that's why they kind of have these rather peculiar expressions. Cause they're oh, strapped, they looked like they were mad at yeah, they look like they were mad at the world. Okay, now now it makes sense. Okay, I appreciate Probably that. Because it was painful. It was painful. <laughs> <laughs> there is a screw in the back of my head here. So it will not move. <laughs> hey, why have you chosen Egypt? Why do you live in Egypt? What's that about? Now, I've always wanted to see the pyramids, but but why Egypt for you? Okay, so I live I live fifty fifty. I, I live in the, the the winter. I come out here because the English winters are just too horrible for me. So I live I live part of the time in 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 London. I have a house in London, <clears throat> but I I can't stand I can't do cold anymore. Right? I mean that's why I lived in California for a long time because of the English weather and the English class system, which I hate. <laughs> but anyway, so um, the I went to Egypt um, initially to sort of because I had a fascination with the ancient Egypt, Egyptian culture. And and I do feel getting going a bit woo woo uh, that I I kind of had some sort of uh, past lives here or something like that. But I'm sure because uh, it, it wasn't rational, you know. I wasn't I didn't study Egyptology. I, that wasn't in my education. But once I sort of con- connected with Egypt, I, there was this powerful draw to the culture, the ancient culture. And and then once I started, you know, coming here to exploring ancient Egypt. Um, I, I sort of realized the the, the, you know, the the culture here is extremely complex, extremely interesting. And Egyptian people are just very, very wonderful people. They're heart-based people. So there's kind of the opposite of the English, you know, a bit shut down emotionally. But they, these guys are just like, they're, they're so lovely. You know, they're so generous. They're so kind. You know, if you're lost, they won't give you directions. They'll walk you to your destination, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And, it, you know, I, I just love that kind of interaction with people. But, you well, know, I mean, on a sort of more professional level, it was also I was doing, you know, I discovered that uh, I could do I could do some sort of articles out here and programs. So I my first BBC radio jobs was doing, going out to Egypt, and that was one on the uh, Great Pyramid and uh, sort of the beginning of the new age tourism. And so people were coming out here to meditate in the temples and the tombs and what have you, or the, the pyramid specifically. So I made a program about that, people who kind of rent the uh, king's chamber and the great pyramid in order to do rituals and stuff like that. So oh. I did a program on that. And then I, I managed to, as part of that, I sort of got to know the guy who had the keys to the great pyramid <laughs> yeah, and, I want to hear this one. And I got well, I got I got so, so the Egyptian government was saying, okay, you can rent the you can rent the space, but it's going to cost you ten thousand dollars or whatever. Something I can't remember. You know, I said, right, okay, what? great. Uh, so I went to sort of like my friend who had called Champion, and he, he used to run up and down the side of the Great Pyramid in front of the kings and queens and the visiting you know aristocracy back in the day. Yeah, and he was an old man with one eye, and he's an amazing guy. And I got friends with him, and he said, look, um, if you want to spend the night in the Great Pyramid, I can arrange that for you. So I said, yeah, sure. So, you know, at 6 o'clock, they op- the, the tourists go, and they shut it down. He opens the door. I go in with my sleeping bag, my little, my book and my flashlight. All by yourself? they lock me in. All by myself. Oh. And they lock you in. They lock you in, right? So, you, so if anything happens, you can't you can't get out, right? And then there's a inside the inside the king's chamber. You know, there's a camera and a little AC thing and a light, and they cut the power, so you're in total darkness. <laughs> How dark was so it? Like, well, there's no light. So this is what was really interesting because there's absolutely no light coming into the king's chamber. It's oh. it's totally pitch black, right? So it's impossible to have any light in there at all right 
Uh, I started meditating, and after about an hour or two, I opened my eyes, and I suddenly realized I could see my hands. And I thought, that's impossible, because I know that there's no source of light. Wow. So I thought, oh, my God, this is, this is, this is a bit scary. And the light, which was this kind of greenish phosphorescent light, it wasn't normal light, you know, white light, uh, started to increase in, in, in luminosity. So I, I thought, oh, my God, any minute now, you know, Tutankhamun Carmoon is going to manifest in front of me. <laughs> and I'm going to be chopped liver. So um, uh, basically, it just kind of rose to a peak, and then it just disappeared. So it's just one of those many anomalies that people report when they go into the king's chamber or the pyramid or, or, or hold around the, you know, the whole idea that the pyramid is some energy resonator was, was actually physically demonstrated to me on, my, on that occasion. That is unbelievable. So, wow, did you feel any different as well or just, just notice the luminosity? Uh, no, I didn't feel it. I was just, I was really scared. So the truth, so I thought, I'm, you know, yeah. just, they'll just find me mummified in the morning, right? You know, um, but no, it was, it was just, it was just a sort of beautiful experience, and sort of like, oh wow, because you know there had been all these stories about the Great Pyramid, and there was this anecdotal one about Napoleon when he invaded Egypt. One of the first things he did was to spend the night in the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> now, I'm not 100 percent sure this sure, sure this is true. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, he, he spent the night in the Great Pyramid, and then he came out in the morning, and his generals came up to him, and, and he looked ashen. He was white with fear. And they came up to him, and they said, oh, you know, um, sir, you know, what's happened? Is it, you know, and, and, he, and he said, that's it. I'm not, you know, don't, 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 that's it. I don't talk about it, right? So he just dismissed it. And then the story was that when he'd finally lost against the British and they put him on Elba for exile, on he was on his deathbed, his aide asked him, please tell us what, what happened to you that night. And he said, even if I told you, you would never believe me. And he went to his, his, his grave, never revealing the secret of what happened. Oh, you have any ideas? <laughs> maybe the dude's just going to lose against the British. I don't know. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But something, something scared him. Something really scared him. Yeah. But yeah, I don't well, know. That's anecdotal. So who knows? Tim, please jump in when, when you want to because Tim's with me here. So I was actually working at one point with Mark Victor, who uh, what you guys would know with Poltergeist. He worked with the blockbuster Poltergeist. He was an author on the, he was one of the writers on the first one. And then I believe, and, and Tim, correct me, I believe he was uh, producers on the other ones. Anyway, he was putting together a, um, uh, internet documentary uh, platform and they I had connected with him and I was out looking for documentaries that were paranormal in some way to be able to put on his platform and that's how I actually met you Tim and it was all mm. about getting out of the blue and uh, so do you remember that do you actually remember that uh, no. yeah it was a long time ago <laughs> yeah, but... oh, well, how did you think we met do you remember um I, 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 I can't really remember. It's coming on. You saw a hot chick so. walking it, by one day and you stopped me. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. I mean, it, it must have been through Mark Victor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <clears> yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, I guess because he had, he had like, uh, he certainly had the afterlife investigations up there and it's i i just put it back up there on his channel yeah but um and, you know you can always see that for free anyway on my on my website and i've got all my yeah. films up there and you can watch them all for free up there anyway i forgot you had so, that memory thing I, I didn't want to expose that i'm i'm sorry i should not have said any of that <laughs> yeah, cool. because because cool. i hope, old, Tony, you know? i got that afterlife yeah. over there to him too bucko just fyi any of those all the all those earnings you got paying for that home in london <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, maybe some food for you, right? Um, hey, yeah, let's talk about that. Now, Out of the Blue, um, that is the one, that's the one film to me, that's the way I always express it is Out of the Blue is the film that if you're on the fence about UFOs being real or not, this is the one that takes you over. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly why we made it. Um, 
and that was with James Fox and Boris Zubov. Um, we sort of you know, got we shared the directing credit on that because it was kind of a three man team, and we put it together for something like twenty thousand dollars, and uh, which I think my mum gave me, <laughs> and nice. uh, we made that one. See, because basically I'd been trying to I'd been writing about the UFO subject. I'd been into the UFO subject like for forever. You know, even when I was like uh, ten years old. You know, I went to a kind of very strict um, preparatory school um, in, in London. That's before they send you off to a private school. And there was like, an, uh, ah. you know, they wanted, they, you know, they'd teach you Latin and stuff like that back in those days in England. And they said, and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to learn Latin. I, I refused to do that. I got all stroppy <laughs> about it. So they said, oh, go and, see, go and see the art teacher and do a project with her. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write an essay about the UFO subject. That was at nice. ten years old. So something was going on there. I was I had a curiosity yes. that began very early. <laughs> so that eventually manifested because I tried to get a documentary um off the ground in England for ages. <clears throat> so this is way back in the nineties, right? Uh and I couldn't get anywhere. So that's really why I moved to the States, because I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna have much you know, my mother's American, I've got a passport, I can live out there. I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna try and make this film. And I looked at all the UFO documentaries around, and they were all pretty rubbish. And then I saw James Fox's <laughs> uh, UFO 50 is a denial, which was his first. And I got hold of James, and I said, hey, dude, this is, this is great. I, um, let's work together. And within three years, we had made Out of the Blue, which was the highest-rated show Huge. in Strand on the Sci-Fi Channel. It was a big success. And Absolutely. I was, to this day, I'm, I'm just that's that's the film I'm pretty much the most proudest of oh. because we pulled you know we pulled it off on a shoestring. Is that does that make sense in America? Like, you know, when you yeah. have any money, no, um, you nailed on, it on a low budget. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and and it and it was very successful, and it and it achieved. You know, as you say, it's like give this film to a skeptic because yeah. it's got, you know, even Michael Shermer, you know, skeptic, the, the famous skeptic, you know, gave us a review, a very positive review. You know, he didn't slam it because the evidence was rock solid. You know, it was very well yeah. done journalistically. Yeah, you, you did know, a great we, job. Thank you. Yeah, you did. I think, and I mean, James, it's been James super, too. It's been, yeah, it's been superseded. I mean, James went on to do some other films on that yeah. subject. Uh, I, I sort of bifurcated and went in another direction to do, do the stuff on life after death. And then James carried on just, just making more stuff on UFOs. And as you know, his latest one, Phenomenon, is, in my view, the best documentary about UFOs that's been, ever been made. <clears throat> so a shout out for James. Good to see you, man. Uh, James, James and I were best friends. And, uh, you know, for one reason or other, I didn't have any children. Uh, that kind of opportunity slipped me by. And I told James, you know, don't don't make the same mistake I have. Have kids. You know, yeah. he met this wonderful woman, and I just said, look, have a child. You know, you, it'll be the best thing in your life, and he did, and it was. And so I'm so glad about that. <laughs> yeah, just it was, it was wonderful to see that. I uh, I haven't talked to him in a long, long, long time, but I remember seeing that happening, and I just thought that was great. That was great. And so yeah, you got yeah, so I kind of I kind of see the film that you did. I know what I saw, and and. And James was with that, right? And I, I thought that was kind of like number two of Out of the Blue. Would you agree with that? That's right. It was, uh, me, that yeah, that was a follow up to, to Out of the Blue, and it had yeah. some of the sort of it's had some of the footages, footage, footage that we shot for or Out of the Blue in it. So I, I know what I saw has some of the footage of Out of the Blue in it, but it's a completely different film. So yeah. I've got a credit on that film. <clears throat> oh, but okay. I didn't direct it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, crop circles. I knew uh, William Gazeki. What did you do mm -hmm. with crop circles and, and quest for truth? Well, uh, um, originally uh, he he brought me in as a cinematographer, um, and so I shot some of it for him. Um, he he'd sort of got this place, a beautiful place in the countryside. You know, he wanted me to sort of uh, do that because I'm because I'm British and I kind of knew that scene a little bit. Although I must admit, it was I was a kind of a newbie into the crop circle scene. Yeah, and I thought yeah. the U I thought the UFO you know community was you know had its first first share of high strange and strange people in it um, until I went to the crop circle scene because <laughs> um, there was there was I mean that was just unbelievable. I mean there's so many interesting people there. 
I, I loved it because it sort of brought all this sort of fascinating people together. You know, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, it just sort of stimulated and produ- produced this fascinating debate about what was going on and how we get to the bottom of it. So that was fun working on that film. <clears throat> and, it, it you know, got... William is an amazing, amazing director. Yeah, and it got pretty creepy. It got pretty strange. There were it wasn't just crop circles. It it was what happens within them. It was also all mm. sorts of different, like psychic kind of weird, crazy things. I mean, it was it, it gets deep in the crop circle world. It gets deeper than I think most people think until they go into it and go, "Holy cow!" I didn't realize yeah. all that stuff was happening. Yeah, I mean, I just think most. People, you know, there was that in the 90s, late 90s, was such an exciting period for me and paranormal because the UFO thing was taking off. You had the X Files, you know. Suddenly, in Britain, anyway, the community sort of opened up to the paranormal, and there was a whole bunch of paranormal magazines and UFO magazines which I was writing for that came out, like the X Factor and things like that. So I, I was that's how I kind of really got into it by writing articles about it, and then sort of edged into the film world on it. So it was really exciting, and, and yeah, the crop circle thing was just, just, just was just on fire in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of settled down now because people have come to whatever conclusions they've come to about it. But I don't think we we still know what's going on there, frankly. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it's interesting because I talked to someone at one point that I really respected in life and and uh, mentioned something about the crop circles. And they said, oh, no, they they debunked that a long time ago with those guys with the board and the ropes. And I just wanted I looked at him and I thought I have lost all respect for you now because <laughs> mm. because people believe yeah, that well, they believe that article. Oh, well, OK, so here's the thing. I was when I was doing the BBC radio program. They asked me to do one about this crop circle making competition. This was back in the 90s, and it was set up by the Guardian newspaper, which is a big national newspaper. Um, and it sort of threw the gauntlet down and to the, the hoaxes, right? Because this is a big problem because people said right. hoaxes and so it contaminated right. the real phenomenon. So they yep. said, okay, you've got, a, you've got six hours to make a rather complicated crop circle, and we're going to judge you by you know how well you do it and the noise and cool. the mess you make and all that and in the morning you know there were some amazingly pristine circles that had been handmade and there were yeah. some pretty bad ones and people drank too much cider and you know they <laughs> you know they could, couldn't they couldn't get it right right so um you know it was interesting to see how well it could be done by humans yeah right um yeah. so one you know one had to be really careful about this because it can be done that way yes it can be done very well um, but at the same time, there are all these characteristics in circle genuine phenomenon, for, for crop circles, that just can't be fake. You know, the exploded yes. node, the bent node, yes. you know, the strange ground traces, the sort of strange things that happen to electronic equipment, um, you know, on and on and on. And I think, you know, the, 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 the most important thing, we, we spoke to some people who actually saw crop circles forming, Mm-hmm. So obviously that was sort of anecdotal because they didn't they didn't record it. But I, one of my favorites was from Nancy Talbot. You know, the I was going to say Nancy, yeah, 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 Nancy. I mean, Nancy put put in the hours there, man. So yes. she, you know, she worked with she worked with uh, this controversial uh, medium, uh, Robert Vandenbroek. Yeah, know, I've you know had him, him on coast. Yeah, I had him. Yeah, had him on coast. Uh, yeah, oh, you I had did. him on coast a couple oh, years did. ago. Okay. Yeah, and when we were talking, all of a sudden it, it went on. We, we were talking to him, I don't know how many minutes in, maybe 30 minutes, maybe it was even an hour and a half, and then cut off, boom, it was over, just gone. That's a pity. I mean, did he tell you the story about the crop circle forming out? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Say it. I was just like, you know, because Nancy, I trust a thousand percent, right? And, Nancy you know, me. she was staying at uh, Robert van den Broek's father's house in Holland. And, you know, that evening there was all the sort of cattle went mad outside. And then, you know, boom, these three shafts of light came sort of searing down into the back garden. And she saw it. uh, Huh? She saw it. She saw it. And the the whole house saw it. You know, they all woke up. Everybody saw it. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody saw it. And then, you know, boom. The, the lights disappeared and there were these kind of there was a steaming crop circle uh, in the garden with her initial in it T 
key. And, you know, she, she'd just been wanting to give up on the crop circle thing. She's I'm too old for this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, you know, the next day, bam, there's a crop circle. There you go. That's just an empty. Now, that makes it, you know, for me, like, I don't care what anybody says about crop circles being fake. There you go. Boom. Crop circle right in front of your eyes. That, so that's one real one. We know that's a real phenomenon. Agreed. And that's when I learned about the nodes, like uh, every like every grass blade with the nodes where, you know, because they were always uh, wherever these were made, it was a lot of high grass. Right. And so the nodes look like what uh, if I remember correctly, they said it was like if it was in a microwave and it would explode. It was like a it was exactly. like po- microwave popcorn. Right. Like and all the nodes. That's were exactly explode. right. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. You know, I mean, we can take that. that? Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You can't. And then there were the insects that were stuck to the, 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 the stems and the stalks and what have you, as if they'd been fused to the to the plant by some strange, you know, energy. So, you know, there's a oh. bunch of stuff. I mean, I, I know that, you know, doing the film um and writing about it, that there was a bunch of people who were out there hoaxing it and I spoke to a lot of them, um, you know, and their motivations what they were doing. I didn't like what they were doing. But, you know, they sort of saw, saw it as a kind of a sort of sociological experiment and blah, 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 whatever, you know. Right. Um, I agree. It just, it, just, yes. it, it just muddies the waters. Thank you very much. When you've got something miraculous occurring, why do you need to go, go out and have to do something like that, you know? I love to hear that from you, Tim, because I feel that way in the Bigfoot world as well, the UFO world, the alien world, the abduction world. And that's what people seem to do. And there's story after story after story about that. And that's why people don't know to go left or right. And that's why uh, I'm the advocate for the truth of all this. <laughs> hey, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something, okay? I, I, I think I may have told you this, but I'm not sure. But, okay, so my dad passed away. Um, I know, I'm so like sorry. 12, I'm so yeah, sorry. it was like 12, what, it was in uh, February 7th, 2010. It was a Super Bowl mm-hmm. Sunday. It was 9 a.m. Okay. when the church doors would open. That would be perfect for my dad to have done it. You know, that would have been my dad. But the day that he passed, later that day when we were back at the house, um, my mom was sitting up on the end of her bed, and and I was standing at the end of the bed. So it was a sleigh bed. So the part of that sleigh part was in between us, right? And mm-hmm. my mom uh, threw a starlight peppermint at me. And a little wrapped up individually one. And I said, Mom, what'd you do that for? She was like uh, two feet away from me. I was like, what'd you do that for? She goes, what are you talking about? I said, you just threw that peppermint on me at me. And she said, no, I did. I said, Mom, come on. I mean, we were the only two in the room. She goes, no, I didn't. I was like, Mom, mm-hmm. you threw that mm-hmm. at me, right? I mean, come on. What's she even lying to me about it? And, and and then we stopped and looked at each other. And I thought, actually, there's no way she could have thrown that without me seeing her entire arm and hand <laughs> throwing it. And we both stopped and went, Dad, because that was dad's little signature little candy that he yeah. always had all yeah. the time, right? And it just came out of thin air. Now, that is what the afterlife, the skull experiments, are like freaking mm. all about. And you yeah, were right. right there producing and directing that. Tell me about that. Um, yes, yeah, so what you're talking about, well, this is sort of after death communications. These, these, that's one thing when, you know, the dead give you a little sign that they're, they're still around and they want to kind of, you know, tell you that and, and, and a number of different ways. And that's very fascinating. And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a pro, uh, one of the programs in the Netflix series is on that signs from the dead, um, which is very wonderful. Where this woman gets a cardinal, um, which she, you know, her mother had had and, and the, the, the you know, very rare bird suddenly appears in, on lands on her shoulder. So you have these wonderful, events where you know the deceased is just saying hey there you go i'm here but in in the skull experiment <clears throat> which i'm not sure how familiar your viewers are with i mean i i specifically more and more people that. talk about it they really do okay yeah because this happened in the you know, like 93 to 98 something like that a uh, five-year experiment um and in my view and in the view of the experts who studied it from the so the uh, um, the SPR, you know, Society for Psychological Research in England, which has been, you know, like the, one of the most prestigious uh, organizations investigating paranormal phenomena over, for over 150 years, they investigated it and they could find no evidence of fraud and they attended sessions, right? So um, 
in in that the, so I was doing it retrospectively. The, the skull experiment had finished by the time I started mm. filming. So okay. I was doing it kind of like interviewing all the participants and getting their video and footage and stuff like that. Um, and it's unique. And and in in the words of Montague Keane, who was one of the investigators, he said, "Like I've never seen anything like that ever." You know, there's just it, it provided more paranormal evidence for the existence of an afterlife than any experiment ever conducted ever yeah. in the history of the paranormal. Period. Yeah. Are you the only right. one that was able to ever show it to anybody else? Is, are you the only? Yeah. 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 We were the only ones to get in there. Then they allowed us to to use the footage and make <laughs> and make the documentary. People have been trying ever since, oh. and and they want to make a movie out of it, but you know, so they've locked to sign some deal with some movie company, so they won't let documentary filmmakers make it until the movie's made, if it ever gets made. <clears throat> so we were like super lucky to get in there. I kind of did that off the back of out of the blue, so I had to get a bit of you know a oh. reputation, so I could um, you know use that to leverage my way in there. You know, and it and worked, huh? We, it worked. It worked. It worked. Yeah. So we <laughs> we were super lucky to get them, and they gave us full access to all their archive. You know, they had wow. five thousand, was it five hundred or five thousand? Anyway, five hundred hours, I think, five hundred hours of recorded uh, audio with spirits uh, who were talking both through the medium. So, that, so this was taking place in a seventeenth-century little farmhouse in Skull, which is a tiny little village in England. Yeah. And they do it in the basement. And these guys are dedicated uh, afterlife researchers, as Robin and Sandra Foy, and and the Violets, who were, who were, the, who were the, um, the mediums, the two mediums, who were like just superstar mediums, just ordinary people who were just like having this amazing gift. And, you know, they would try for like a year, you know, and sit for two hours of every week and nothing would happen for a year, right? So, you know, you've got to be really dedicated. And then suddenly the phenomenon started to happen more and more and more. And mm. it just got so amazing that they could just sit down and regularly, the spirits would come through, talk through the larynxes of the mediums who would go into trance. And then you could have a two-way conversation with a spirit, which is pretty cool. And then later it developed so that the voices just come out of thin air. Yeah. Right? And, then and that's stuff. even more cool. Yeah, and there was like, okay, so to go to, back to your question about the apports, these objects, apports that, that appear manifest out of nowhere, they had a whole bunch of stuff that would just like appear. And just one of the most. Out of the sky or air, out of the was, air. Sorry? They just would just fall out of the air. Just. Poof. They would literally, yeah, so you're in the science room, you're in, in darkness, okay, because physical mediumship doesn't work uh, at all when you've got light sources in there. Sometimes you can have a little bit of light, red light, but usually it's in darkness because the energies don't you know, are destroyed by the uh, by normal daylight or electric light, yeah? Um, so, uh, but in the skull experiment, they had kind of luminous strips on stuff. And they also had these little, these little kind of orb-like things they called spirits, which would zip around the room. So that, and that would illuminate things. So you could actually see stuff going on. But the apports would literally, you just hear a thump on the table and there was an object which could be a coin, a piece of jewelry, pen knife. And in one case, you know, like they had, they had like 50 or 60 uh, different objects appear out of nowhere. And they said that these were, they weren't stolen. You know, they didn't nick, steal them from somebody. They belonged to the deceased or what, 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 what have you, you know, they, <clears throat> they were taken. And they would often have special significance for the sitters in the seance. OK. Yeah. And in one case, they had a newspaper, right, from 1945, I think, Ugh. like pristine newspaper that dropped on the sales table. And it uh, was very interesting because it had an article in it on Helen Duncan, who's a very famous English medium who was suffered enormously for her mediumship. Right. Ugh. Now, right. she was such a successful medium that she was able to she had a communication with the uh, a, a sailor who had died on a ship, this was during the Second World War, and who communicated with her. And this was before the authorities had said that the ship had sunk. So she knew about this before the authorities released the information. And so they oh. were really anxious about that because that was like, you know, oh, what's kind of spying kind of thing? You know, so, you know it's dangerous to national security. And so she was prosecuted under this ridiculous thing called the, you know, the Witchcraft Act. Yes. It's gone back yeah. centuries. 
Oh. And was still in still in 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 activation, you know. And so oh. she was put in prison, and oh my God, she suffered horribly. So she had this. She probably no, that's right. She told them that she had uh, apported this newspaper into the sounds room as a way of saying, "Hey, look, it's me," and you know, this is kind of like what happened to me. And the interesting thing was they had the paper analysed, right? Because anyone can like mock up a newspaper and print it on modern newspaper. They had the print newspaper actually analysed by the leading paper specialist in the world, and they showed that it was the paper from 1944 that you could only get that time because they only had chem- you know they didn't have chemicals that you couldn't get because of the war shortages. So it was a genuine article. It had come. It had been made in 1944, and then boom, out of it, it comes out of nowhere. Now that is what's called a permanent permanent paranormal object. It's it's definitive proof of a paranormal event, which in this case is associated with coming from the afterlife. Oh man! Did, what about the apple? I mean, I guess you could just take a bite of it, no big deal. I mean, did, did what the, what apple? What, did you say an apple? Also, I thought you apport, said an apple. Apport. Apport. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Because, okay, apport. as I thought, I guess I missed the apple. I didn't see the apple. Yeah, maybe I remember seeing like, like plants. Apport. Apport means it comes from the French apporter to carry or to sort of right. transport. Right. So right. it's it's what that's described what these events are. Right, right. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought you said apple. It's that beautiful accent of yes. yours. So I rem and, and I remember like what looked like plants to me. It just looked like plants coming. Okay, down. yeah. Yeah. So this this is uh, so I, I covered the skull experiment. And I also covered a bit about um, ITC, instrumental transcommunication, which all your viewers will know about, listeners will know about. But there, this was a particularly interesting thing with this guy called Marcello Barci, who was a medium and the leading exponent of direct radio voice, which is where a purported spirit voice has come through the radio. Okay. So uh, we went down to Grosseto in Italy to film him. And he has a center there where people from all over the world turn up and usually parents have tragically lost their children and they want to communicate uh, with their child, right? And so the center is covered with pictures of all these children who have actually come through his radio. And that's Mm -hmm. just so miraculous. And then, you know, we spoke to some of the mothers who'd spoken to, the, the, the voices had come through the radio and the mothers had recognized their child And, um, you know, they just get so, you know, so much solace, so much relief Mm -hmm. from that experience. You know, they burst into tears and it's like it was really emotional. But what happened and we've got that we had that we we got footage because when we went to that that event uh, with the radio, um, it was like a two hour event. There's lots of people in there and, and nothing happened. Right, because he just tunes the radio in between stations and gets static, and then something hopefully comes through. But nothing happened, so I thought, oh dear, I've come all this way and I haven't got anything. But he said, oh, don't worry about it. Well, we'll go next door and we'll have a seance. So I said, oh, I didn't even know you do seances. So I said, yeah, cool. Can we can we film it? You know, we've got night shot cameras, so uh, we can film it in the dark. And he said, yeah, nice. okay. So we put the cameras on. They started the seance, and he said, right, you've got to switch the cameras off. And I secretly kept one running because I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna miss it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> bad boy, and bad I, boy. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I did because yes. we, captured, we captured some amazing stuff coming in. So I was in the sounds. So that's the first one I've ever been to, right? And the first of all, the table is this very heavy oak table. It's just you know you're in the dark, right? But you could, I have my hand on the table, and the table just sort of lifts off the ground as if it, you know, weighs nothing and starts floating in in space. Yeah, and then uh, I was sitting on the floor, and I felt all these things fall on me. And when the lights came on, the entire séance room was just covered in flowers. It was like somebody transported like a flower shop, the contents of a flower shop in this room. <laughs> yes, that's what I remember. Yes. Yeah. It's just like, holy cow. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I just, it just completely blew me away. Now, obviously, skeptics are going to say, oh, well, somebody just came in the room and threw flowers, right? You know, because it's in the dark. But you've got to remember that Barchi had been doing this for 40 years. He'd been investigated by a bunch of scientific investigators. 
He never asked money for his work. He's never accepted donations. And, you know, he got all these amazing results. And scientists who investigated him have never found any evidence of fraud, ever. So he's the real... And you were there, too. You were there, too. What did you yeah. see? I mean, I know you. You would check it out. So you checked it all out. I checked it all out. We, you know, there was a guy... We, we, there was... Okay, so the voices come through, right? Right. And in one case is... One case, um, a young girl had died. It's a teenage girl that died in a car accident. And her father was there. I wasn't there at the time. I just got this, this recording. And so, they, so the father had recorded her voice when it came through the radio. And she recognized his deceased daughter. Okay. They then took a recording of her when she was alive. And they used this FBI-endorsed uh, software. Because, you know, uh, a voice is like a fingerprint. Everybody's voice is different, right? Mm -hmm. biometric identification. They use it to save, you know, for sort of security, right? So they ran it through the software and the two voices when compared were 98% of the 98% comparison, which is enough to say it's the same voice. So the deceased voice came wow. through, the living voice, they were identical, identical. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, the films, it's, it's incredible to watch it. I'm, <laughs> I... When I just saw all those plants, I just remember all those plants. That's why I, was, I thought you had said apple earlier. I'm like, I guess I missed the apple. But, of course, I would think that that could happen since I saw all those, like, <laughs> plants and flowers and everything that came down. And the table, yeah, you knew that the table was heavy and it was just moving around. It was like some – it was crazy in so much activity. It was – I've mean, never like, seen if, anything like it. If, if, we talk, if we talk about – go back to the skull experiment, which is so amazing – they had, they also had levitations and stuff like that. I can tell yeah. you a couple of stories about that. So in the states, they had, a, they did seances in, in very four, four, four or five different countries, and they did some in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They did this really remarkable thing where, <clears throat> um, to me, it was the most, one of the most impressive. Well, they had spirit materialization. They had like a hand that would materialize in the seance room and float around. And touch people, and so people could actually feel this disembodied hand. Now that's pretty remarkable. <laughs> that doesn't normally happen in the sales rooms. Only okay, in the Adams so, family do you see anything like that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, it, it was a bit like that. Except that you know, people would actually see this hand, but they could also touch it, and it felt warm to the touch, and just like a normal human hand. And yet it's being manifested from the spirit world, which I find remarkable. And then um, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who you probably know all about his work, right? He was uh, there at the seance room and the sort of the, the, the spirit said to him, uh, he said, oh, hand, can I touch you? And, and, he, and the woman who was actually, there was a woman's hand. She said, yes, you can. And he, <laughs> so he reached down, he, he said, he reached down, he touched the hand and, and he said, oh, why, why, can, why can I only touch a hand, you know? And, he, and they, they, they said, look, you know, it's hard enough getting a hand materialized. You know, you want the whole body to be really hard. <laughs> but, so just be happy with the hand, right? So, yeah, you, you, know, then you always want more. You always want more. They always want more. <laughs> well, they got more. They got the uh, Robin and Sandra Floyd, her, their mother and their father, Robin's father and mother and sister, who are all deceased, eventually manifested in full physical form in front of them in the seance room. Oh, and my. And he could, he could converse with them and he could touch them. I mean, that is as good as it gets in physical yeah. mediumship. Both wow. Mind, okay. Right? okay, I'm going to throw something at you, okay? Cool. So, yeah. so hang in there with me. Hang in there with me. Um, I'm going to materialize it right at you. Okay. So, so I know you're, you, uh, you knew Bud Hopkins, right? I did. Yeah. Okay. Did you know Jacobs, you. David Jacobs? Yeah. Okay. I so did. Jake, yeah. I interviewed Jacob Jacobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Loved him. One of my good friends, uh, also knew Bud, uh, at the very end of his life. Um, but mm. Jacobs mm. would say, and I know that he probably said it because of Bud as well. Uh, they were best of friends, right? And and did their research. Mm. They could even, you know, they could think separate of each other too. But I believe they both agreed on this. They they were pretty much right on the same uh, line with each other, for sure. But 
Jacobs had said to me at one point, he said, Dr. David Jacobs, you guys, the alien abductions is, is uh, what we're discussing here is he had said, I wouldn't be surprised if all the things that people experience are aliens doing the talking, doing any of the touching, any of the things that people might think is a ghost or might think is this or that or this. So when people experience ghosts in homes uh, or any type of thing, you know, maybe even like the skull experiments or anything like you have been talking about, he would say it's a good possibility it could be the ET and they're just, you know, it's okay. They'll just, whatever you want to think it is. Nah, what do you think of that? that for a minute. No, nah, that was one of their thoughts. Not. That was one of their thoughts. I mean, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They, you know, what obviously you're getting a, a variety of different things. I mean, you know, the majority of things going on in seances are from communication with dead people. Okay. <clears throat> in the skull experiment, they did a sort of, of kind of video thing where they were actually able to get sort of images uh, sent from the afterlife, if you like. And they got this one image of this kind of what they call blue. And he was like like a kind of gray alien. He looked like that, except he was blue, and it was his head. So yeah. he came in. They had voices coming in saying, "Well, there's an alien um, right there, dude." <laughs> yeah, there's an alien. Okay, sure. I mean, they can come in. You know, they're, they're, they've obviously got interdimensional capacity. So and it was that's, interesting that's, looking. That's too. no it problem. You know, you, you so you've got aliens come in, but they're not masquerading as spirits. I mean, because no, 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 but. Who, but he's saying yeah. that the aliens could masquerade as anything you want just so you'll believe. Ah, you, okay. I get yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I'm I sorry. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. and he – right? Because if that makes it easier for you to handle, then then that's what makes it easier for you to handle them. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. I hadn't heard that one. That's, that's yeah. super interesting. It, it I is, mean, Yeah. It? I mean, yeah. instead of it being an owl or something else, I mean, you know, this kind of like whatever they want to – present to you so you don't get freaked out yeah absolutely yeah yeah personally mm-hmm. i would like i would like to see them as they actually are you know i mean i'm totally up for that you know what i mean i want to see what what these beings actually look like and interact with them you yeah know, well then like stick the, with me children, baby i'll show them to you you ready are you now ready I'm for worried. it now i'm now i'm now i'm getting worried now getting i worried. know <laughs> it's true i've seen some crazy things out there you know uh, this is, yeah this i'd love is to the... talk to you about that more at another time yeah. you know because yeah. you're, you're the expert on that one it's the abduction i kind of like tip to tip my toe into and you know and i knew bud um very well, because, uh, you know, mm-hmm. he was a partner with Leslie Kane, who's my best That's friend. That's right. And, That's right. And, and we, we we collaborated on a lot of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And and she was behind the, the Netflix series. Um, yep. So I, I would sit down with Bud. I, you know, I stayed in his apartment in New York, and we would talk for hours and hours about adoption. Um, but, I, you know, I, he went right down the rabbit hole there with that one. And and I didn't go down as far because I'm just still confused about what's really going on with the Dutch. And it's such a complicated phenomenon. They so, are. Uh, I just think Bud and Jacobs really just nailed it. I think they nailed it. Yeah. What about I think, Dr. Mac? Yeah. Well, they liked him, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, he brought a huge amount of credibility to the whole thing. You know, I interviewed, yeah. I interviewed John in London when the uh, Travis Walton film came out in London, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. fire in the sky. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was interested. So he, he came over and I was interviewing him. And, you know, was, that was actually one of the reasons I kind of got super interested in deduction because I found him so impressive, you know, a man of his intellectual caliber had done the homework, you know. Yeah. Which and, one are you talking, he, Travis or John? Uh, sorry, John, John Mack. John, John Mack. Mack. Okay, I you're talking loved, John Mack. I, okay. I just love that guy. I love that guy. And you know, I never he met him. This film. Oh, he's an amazing guy. Yeah. You know, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. He had a brain the size of you know Florida, and you know, he was just very open-minded, and he was able to sort of get into a subject which you know, as an academic, you know, you can lose your career over. You know, so he. Had That's guts. what I liked about I Bud really, and Jacobs. The same way, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're out there on the edges, and especially this is yep. going back a bit. I mean, it's much more mainstream now, but you know, back then, oof, you know, I mean, I did yeah. I did a program on abduction for the BBC Radio, which I was amazed I got that I, they accepted it, and I interviewed some abductees and blah blah blah, and it was a short. It's on the it's on the it's on the website, um, but it's sort of it was like when I broadcast it. 
um, they didn't tell me that the that some BBC guy came in afterwards and said, oh, well, you know, abduction has been scientifically investigated and we don't think it's true. They didn't tell me that when it went out on the broadcast. I was really pissed about that. Oh. But, you know, kind of, that's, that's par for the course, you know. Is it white BBC, noise? It to be German. Huh? Which, which, what, which, what, what's the name of, where's the documentary that you're talking about? Or, or what's radio, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry. This was a short five minute radio program for oh, BBC I'm Radio sorry. 4. Oh, and I'm I sorry. did it okay. ages ago. So that's because I, I had met this abductee. Um, so, and, and John, John, I think John's in that one. And I did a, did I do an interview? Yeah, I did an interview with Travis Walton as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see so Travis's was, face on one. Okay. Okay. You know, I mean, these are all the big famous cases, you know. Yeah, and, and no doubt, now to me, this is me, this is me, and, you know, um, it's it's great talking with Travis. I think he's uh, one of the one-timer people. I think otherwise you're lifers, and you're taking a lot all the time, all your life. But I think once in a while, there's like it happens once in a while. Now, and I think that's what happened with Travis. That's what, that this is my thought. But Jacobs would fight and argue that and maybe and maybe because bud would say it too i don't know i've just spent more time with jacobs but he had he he thought well i i wouldn't be surprised if he hadn't been taken before this is sticking with what they had learned and what their research showed them um i also had i'd been at bud's apartment hanging out and talking with him there he's just, he's just amazing amazing people amazing people yeah absolutely you know he's he's, he's sorely missed you know, but I mean, let me ask you this. I want to ask you a question, basically. So okay. we know that we know that ETs have been uh, neutralizing nuclear missiles. We know that the the U.S. government because of out of the blue of taught me that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so you can you can see in out of the blue that the interview we have is um, Salas, you know, who was the yeah. launch control officer at Malmstrom Air Force Base Amazing. when the the UFO hovered over the base and switched off twenty two ICBMs, right? Mm. And he's yeah. come out more and more since the film. Um, and that's become much more accepted, yeah. But when we did out of the blue, it's still a bit on the edge. Um, and that's a fascinating thing. Now, okay, so, so, and he says, of course, that, you know, they did that as a demonstration to, to show us that don't use nukes, you know. You kids can't play with these kind of toys, right? Too dangerous. You're too primitive, mm-hmm. right? So, okay. um, and other, other people <clears throat> have gone further um, you know, because in the Rua case, where the, there was this contact case, you know, in Zimbabwe, when uh, the kids saw this UFO land and the ETs came out and interacted yes. with the kids, and, yeah, and Dr. Yeah. Mack invested back, investigated yeah. that, and it's really amazing. And, of course, you know, like many abductees, they were told, that, hey, you guys are screwing up the planet. What are you doing? You, you know, don't go down this technological route and screw up the planet, right? So the, the extrapolation from that is, you know, if they're willing to intervene to kind of stop us blowing ourselves up with nukes, do you think they will have a kind of intervention, you know, like alcoholics, you know, we have the family have to take them to a clinic and against their will because they can't save themselves? Do you think they would intervene on a level to stop us destroying the planet in terms of climate change and stuff like that? Oh, man, I tell you what, we just got a couple minutes here to close out. So I'll tell you really quickly. They can do – this is me. This is my theory, okay? You ready for it? <laughs> I'm they're ready. Gonna, ready. They're, they're not going to do any intervention with us. If they if it's important for them to keep the planet fine, uh, then they will just keep the planet good any way they want, whether it's taking us out or just fixing it on their own or, you know, if that scenario is, is really going to happen or be the case. I mean, they can – what I've seen, what I've learned, they can do anything they want and they can take us out in a heartbeat and they can just shut us off. I think they can turn us off and on and they can just shut us off and do whatever they want us to do. They don't need to intervene. They can make us do what they want us to do. That's what I've learned. Oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, good try, but you know, okay, bring it on. Let's talk. Well, let's talk. So, so we've got a, Tim, it, it just flew by. You're awesome. You're so fun. I'm glad you had enough energy to hang in there with us for a couple hours. Tell everybody where to find you and what's next. What's next with you? What's next is um, I'm just editing together the stuff that uh, I shot um, with, but, you know, cause we were going to do a trilogy of films on the afterlife. 
So we did the afterlife investigations. We did Calling Earth, which is about ITC communication, which is on my website for free. And then I'm going to do the finish off that footage, which is just lying in my drives, which is, you know, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, mediumship and reincarnation. So that's the next one. Excellent. Wow. Dude, where are you going to fit our work in? When's that going to happen? <laughs> what, me and you in the RV are looking for Sasquatch, yeah? Maybe. <laughs> if, if maybe. <laughs> may, maybe, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tim Coleman there. Wow. Award-winning documentarian, filmmaker, photographer, journalist, broadcaster, and friend. So you take care, Tim, okay? And hey, you ready to see some stuff. I'm ready to show you. Get I you want to see Egypt. it. Yeah. I want to see it. I want to see it's more than that picture you sent me. I want to see some <laughs> something else. I want to see okay. something up close and personal, right? <laughs> They're going to talk to you. They're going to go, Tim, nice to meet you. It's been a while. What took you so long? That's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just been hanging out in Egypt, taking pictures of Egyptians while he's out there. That's, so that's what's going on with Tim. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tim. I really appreciate it. You take care. All right. So Tim Coleman uh, joining us. Great guy. Great guy. I'm going to freak him out one day. I'm telling you, I'm going to freak him out and it'll be fun. And then he'll be like, what took me so long? Oh, mercy. Thank you guys uh, for enjoying that with me too. Let me know if you have enjoyed that. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. Jorge Martin has been a journalist for more than 30 years. He specializes in UFO and alien phenomena, writing about those from the vantage point of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. But he also has covered a heck of a lot about U.S. military activity down in that area, written tons of articles. He's Uh, lectured all over the world, uh, has written a number of books. He's the editor of a magazine, and he's joining us now to talk about Fidel Castro's interest in these topics. Jorge, great to have you on the show. Thank you, George. Glad to be on your show tonight. I am uh, trying to think how long it is that we've known each other. It's got to be early 90s, 1990, 1991. 91, I I believe, yes. I have the highest regard for you. You've always been an honest guy in terms of as a journalist, as a reporter, and I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about this. Um, let's start this way. It doesn't it, it? I know a lot of people don't like Fidel Castro for all kinds of reasons, historical reasons, policy reasons. But regardless of what you think about him as a dictator or leader, mm-hmm. he strikes me as a guy who has a, a avid interest. He reads a lot. He knows about the world around him. So I'm sort of not surprised that he might have an interest in these kind of topics. Is that what struck you? Well, the thing is that uh, uh, I have never heard that about Fidel Castro or the Cuban government to, to talk openly about the UFO matter before. Uh, this was something that uh, I knew just by accident, okay? Uh, talking with some people who knew him uh, from Puerto Rico, who were friends of his, who visited Cuba. Uh, lawyer Juan Maribras, who was a pro-independence political leader here in Puerto Rico. And a friend of his, Mrs. Uh, Providencia Trabal. Uh, on one occasion, I was uh, back in the year 2002. I was participating in a book fair here in Puerto Rico, uh, and I was uh, introducing the book I published about the incident in Vieques. You know this island in the east of Puerto Rico, yes, where there was this struggle with the U.S. Navy, with the people of Vieques who wanted the Navy to leave the island, etc. The Navy was using the, the island uh, as a bombing site, an experimentation site, and for military exercises. Uh, but uh, we discovered there that, apart from that, the island was being used, okay, secretly uh, by the U.S. Navy in some type of uh, secret uh, alien contact, okay? They were... Uh, in the area that was used for the bombing practices that was of limits to everyone, uh, we were able to speak with people who were there in security, uh, civilian guards, Puerto Ricans who were there also for the U.S. Navy in security, uh, and many others who worked there. And in many occasions, they saw these huge craft coming down, okay, and landing there. The, the Puerto Rican uh, personnel was taken out from the area, from the site, as well as the low land ring uh, officer from the Roosevelt Road Naval Station and the Navy, and uh, only high-ranking officers remained there. Whatever they were doing there with whoever was in those ships, we don't know. But we also found uh, that uh, there was a very high activity, alien activity, in the area, 
All the fishermen all around the island, if you go there, George, you can verify this by yourself. All the, the fishermen there have had experiences of this crab coming out from the water, going into the water all over the island, around the island. Uh, uh, they saw these great type aliens, humanoids, uh, coming up from the sea and going into the lagoons in the island, coming up from the lagoons, and many other situations. The policemen there, the state, the state policemen, the, the municipal policemen, the government officers of the municipality of the island, uh, everyone there had seen this, but they were afraid to talk about it before I, I went there because of the, you know, the, the struggle they had with the U.S. Navy, and they were afraid that, you know, they, they were, something could happen. So they prefer not to talk about it. But then they opened up, and all this information came out. I was in this book fair in the year, in the year 2002 uh, presenting the book, and while doing that, I met a, a lawyer, Juan Mari Bras, and Mrs. Providencia Trabal. He was uh, also presenting a book he had made on the, his uh, uh, political uh, ideas about the situation of Puerto Rico. Uh, and we began talking about the situation of the UFOs. Mr. Mario Brad had to leave for a moment, and I continued talking on with Mrs. Providencia Trabal, who was very interested in the UFO matter because she had had experiences herself, something I didn't know about. And then all of a sudden she said, hey, you know something? Uh, Juan Mari is very interested in this matter of the UFOs. And well, Juan Mari is who? Who is that? Juan Mari Brass is the lawyer uh, here in Puerto Rico who was a very prominent uh, political leader uh, advocating for independence for Puerto Rico and also a socialist leader here in the island. And he was a friend, a personal friend of Fidel Castro. He visited very frequently the, the island of Cuba, and Mrs. Traval was a very close person, uh, very close to, to, to Mr. Juan Maribras. And she told me that Maribras was very interested in this matter, and he says, really? And she says, yes, because uh, he, on one occasion we began talking, and he just talked about the situation, and he was very interested. And he told us that Fidel Castro had told him uh, something very important. He said, Fidel Castro talked to him about the UFOs and aliens and things like that, and she said, yes. Uh, he told us that on one occasion they were talking in Cuba, and Fidel Castro uh, disclosed to him that on one occasion before the fall of the Soviet Union, he had visited Cuba. I believe, uh, George, that it could have been in the 60s, at the beginning of the 60s. And he was taken by the Soviet authorities to this military base, which I believe must be in Astrakhan, in the Shiktor area. And uh, he was shown in a special laboratory that they had there in a building, uh, a place there where they had this uh, craft. He was shown a flying saucer type craft, and allegedly, uh, uh, by what uh, Mario Brad said, uh, the corpse of his uh, pilot. Okay, and uh, and he told all things to him too, and uh, I said. Wow, I, I never imagined that something like that. And he said, well, he's very serious about this, and I believe him because he's a, a very serious uh, person. And I know Marie Brass uh, was a very straightforward person in his ideas. Uh, and he, if he said that, it must have been true. Later on, uh, as he returned, I talked to him, me and my wife, Marlene, and, and he acknowledged everything. But he wouldn't elaborate more on it because he felt that maybe Castro had told him this in confidence, and he shouldn't be talking about this. But but he acknowledged that it was true. And he told you that you had to keep it quiet until some no. undetermined. No, the thing is that uh, I had the information for for years, as you can see, since nineteen since, since uh, year two thousand two. Prior to that, George, I had had some knowledge about Castro's interest in the possibility of uh, intelligent life, alien life in the universe. Uh, because uh, in year 2000, the filmmaker and documentalist from Cuba, Octavio Cortázar, who was very well known, and he, was, he, he was, uh, had been also president of the UNIAC, the National Union of Cuban Writers and Artists. Uh, and also he has been professor of uh, the, the, the first uh, filming school 
uh, and television school in Cuba, and was also a professor in different countries, in Spain and other places too. And he was very known in Cuba and very respected because of this. And he came to Puerto Rico in the year 2000 to participate in a filming festival here at San Juan Cinema Fest, which was celebrated in San Juan, in Puerto Rico. And when he came, he called us to our office, asking to meet with us because uh, he was uh, very fond of the UFO uh, matter. And he had, uh, as a matter of fact, he had uh, produced a documentary about the UFO incidents in Cuba. And he wanted to meet with us. To, to give us a copy of the of the documentary. We met in his hotel in San Juan, and we talked about the, the UFO incidents in Puerto Rico and in Cuba and, you know, and, 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 and the different type of cases that have happened here and the similarity, type of similarity with many of the cases happening in Cuba, which I knew nothing about at the moment. It was very interesting to, to hear everything he had to say and then to see the, 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 the documentary because it was a very good one, even, even though it was Simply done, it was a very good documentary with a lot of very good information. And then he told me, uh, I don't know why, all of a sudden he said, you know something? Uh, I can tell you this. Uh, Fidel Castro is very interested in this matter and in the, the possibility of alien life in the universe, intelligent life. And I said, why did you say that? And he said, because when the Pope John Paul II visited Cuba in 1998, he met with his ADs first and talked with a couple of them, uh, some priests, and talked about the possibility, what they thought about the possibility of the uh, intelligent life out in the universe, apart from, from Earth. And they expressed to him that they believed that maybe 99% was very probable that, that, that there was life outside the Earth, you know, and possibly intelligent life. And then later on, he said, when he met personally Pope John Paul II, and they discussed the matter. And they talked about everything, and they agreed that they, there was a very high probability that there was a, a intelligent life in the universe. And allegedly, according to what Kotarsa told me, apparently they also talked about the UFO matter in that occasion. So, well, I so just, to just to make sure, just to make sure I've got this, so... In 98, the Pope visits Cuba, and he has a conversation mm -hmm. with Fidel Castro in which they discuss not only mm -hmm. the possibility of E.T. life out there, and they conclude that it's real, but the possibility that UFOs represent something alien. Well, I don't know if really the, the, the UFOs, the Cortázar told me that apparently they had discussed that. And they expressed uh, uh, the, 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 the opinion that there is life out there in the universe, but you don't know what was said about UFOs. Well, uh, according to Mr. Cortázar, they discussed the possibility of alien life, and uh, life in, in the universe, and they agreed on the possibility that it, it was very high, you know, that it, it was very possible. And according to Cortázar, too, uh, apparently they discussed the alien matter and, and the UFO matter. It makes you wonder if, if Castro would have confided to the Pope what he had seen in the late 60s, what you were just telling us about. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. You don't, you don't know the answer, though? I don't know the answer, no. Back to this thing about Castro being shown this. Uh, where did you say this base was? Well, uh, apparently, uh, that's a... Uh, you don't know for uh, sure. That, that's a hypothesis of mine. Okay. I believe it must have been, you know, there are two places in Russia where uh, there have been a very high uh, activity, uh, alien activity, and where it has been said that the Russian government and the ex-Soviet Union uh, have uh, some sort of area, uh, area 51 type facility, you know, where right. they have these crafts and they are doing a reverse engineering on them and they have a corpses of, of alien. Uh, is that Kaputsin Yar? Is that one of them? Kaputsin uh, Yar, I think I, it's. I, I believe that it must be Kaputsin Yar in Shikhtar area, in Astrakhan. So you, it, it, Fidel Castro would have been shown this. Do, is any indication that the Russians said, look, we'll show it to you, but you have to keep your mouth shut? I didn't know that. Okay. Why I'm I asking believe, is – I believe that they must have said that to him and also that for some reason he, he decided to keep this confidential. Uh, but according to what Mrs. Uh, Traval said uh, and Marie Ras, uh, he was shown the craft, a flying saucer type craft. And the course of an alien that looked very human, but very tall in size. Very tall? 
Very strong insights, yes. Um, you indicated that you also had kept this quiet. You've known about it since 2002, but you had to wait until the conditions were okay. right. Can you tell me what the conditions were? What's okay, changed? The thing, the thing is that when Cortázar told me this about his, uh, his knowledge, uh, the knowledge he had about the discussion of Castro with the Pope John Paul II, uh, he told me that he preferred for it to be uh, Castro himself who eventually uh, disclosed everything and talked about it. Okay? Uh, and I respected that. I gave him my word that I would do that, you know, at that moment. Uh, then, afterwards, when I came to the knowledge of the, the information that was given to me by Mrs. Traval and, and Mary Ruff, uh, thinking about what uh, my promise to, to, to Mr. Cortázar, I preferred to keep it quiet. Until now, because uh, Fidel Castro published recently one of his so-called reflections, you know, in which he writes on, about different items, uh, geopolitical situation, uh, ecology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As you said, he's very keen, you know, uh, he's very involved with many type of uh, uh, of activities. Yeah, he has and wide interests, right. That's what you said at the beginning of the show. And he's very like that, for all I know. And he published this reflection in which he was talking about the possibility of a war, that that could happen at any moment, you know, uh, the danger we were involved with at this moment, and also talk about ecological matters, and then he veered into the area of possible life in the universe, you know. And he talked about his meeting with the ADs of the Pope back in 1998 and the discussion he had with the Pope himself. Okay, so he said said all this, admitted it. He opened the door, and I felt that, uh, the promise I had given to Mr. Cortaza uh, uh, was well kept, but as uh, Mr. Castro uh, opened the door himself, I felt I could publish the, all the information I had. I've always thought, uh, Jorge, I've thought about uh, Cuba as a uh, as a place that would could blow the lid off the UFO mystery because, you know, they must see all kinds of what we would call UFOs, but by that I mean American spy planes and drones and satellites flying over it to keep an eye on to see if any missiles are going in or whatever they're up to. They must see all kinds of things in the sky and have, have great capabilities for detecting mm-hmm. things that intrude their airspace. I would think that Cuba must be sitting on a treasure trove of UFO-type information, and if they wanted to, they can embarrass the U.S. by putting out what they know. Well, I know uh, as a fact that for for many years they have been involved with the UFO situation, even though they don't talk about it officially. The uh, the, the Cuban Academy of Sciences seldomly say anything about the UFO matter. Okay, the, most of the investigation and research is made by by civilians, uh, but we know uh, as a fact that since the sixties. There have been many, many important UFO incidents that have occurred there in the island uh, in which uh, military personnel from the Cuban go- government were involved with, you know. And also that, uh, especially in the 60s, when the Russians were there uh, and they had this scientific personnel in their bases, etc., in many of these occasions where, uh, in which uh, important incidents occurred, the Cuban military forces asked for the help of the of the Russians and many investigations were were done together you know and this uh, got uh, the the officers of the of the Cuban go- uh, government more involved with the situation they were became more aware of the reality of all of this and there have been many incidents uh, you may remember the incident that happened back in 19, in the 70s in which a uh, uh, a Cuban MiG jet fighter was destroyed by by a huge uh, spherical shaped craft uh, when when the pilot announced that they they would you know uh, fire a missile to this object and all of a sudden the 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 plane uh, broke apart and exploded in the air silently and uh, the other jet aircraft that was accompanying it uh, reported everything this was reported uh, in the United States because they heard the the communications. The, so a, a, uh, a Cuban MiG was shot that down. In, in Florida that, that uh, uh, could hear everything that was happening. And there were many other incidents like those. So they are very aware of the situation. Uh, so a Cuban MiG was shot down by a UFO. Yes, that's correct. 
Yeah, I don't know. Do you have sources in the Cuban military or within Cuban uh, civilian sources that uh, know about the military, about what else they might have? Well, I have been uh, I have been uh, contacting people who, who know about the situation in Cuba, including uh, Cuban uh, UFO researchers. Uh, uh, there are many things that have come out from the United States themselves, you know, uh, people in the military who were uh, – uh, how can I say, George, uh, who, who knew about these incidents that were happening. And there have been books and also uh, the documentary coming out from Cuba now uh, with many reports of incidents that have been happening there. And that's the way I've been getting all this knowledge about the situation there. You've followed this field for so long. Uh, Give me your thoughts about the Vatican. Now, this conversation that you say took place between uh, the Pope and and, uh, Castro in uh, the late 90s, you know, in, in the years since then, the Vatican has radically changed its uh, its position on UFOs and ET life. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've they've come way way out uh, on this topic, saying that it's real, that there's nothing fundamentally uh, at odds with what the Church believes. It's That's almost right. as if they're preparing us. I wonder if the information Castro gave them uh, affected the, the Church's position on this stuff. No, not only that, George. Uh, as we know, the Vatican is a power. Okay, it's another power from 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 from, from our, in our planet, uh, a political power, and they have knowledge. They have their own intelligence uh, uh, division. They have all knowledge about what's going on all over the world, so, and they know about this matter too about the UFO. Help me. Uh, let's broaden the topic a little bit to beyond Fidel Castro. I, I just well, one more question about him. I wonder if there are any plans for after he's gone. Uh, to make any kind of revelation. I would think that if, if he dies, that the American government extends a hand and we become friends again, that we'll never see whatever's in those files. Well, I hope that he, before he dies, he's, he will, you know, say something about this. Because uh, bereft, what you may think about uh, his ideology, etc., uh, if he does uh, if he does this, you know, he, if he do this and, and talks about what he knows, it would help a lot, you know, to get this out to the public and help make some changes in our world that were badly needed, you know. Could just be that the Russians still don't want him to talk about it. Well, I don't know. As you know, at this moment, uh, Harold Castro was visiting Russia in a surprise visit in the tour he was doing in, in Asia. And who knows if they were talking about this, too. Uh, broaden the topic they, a little they, bit. They, must, they must, must be aware that this has come out. Yeah, I, I, they monitor this stuff pretty closely. Uh, on another subject from uh, down in your part of the world, Chupacabra. I have never given much credence to this. I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't studied it in depth, but I know that that's where the, the whole story originated. What do you make of that? And what's the Chupacabra situation, if there is one, now? Well, right now there's nothing. Nothing is going on, but but I can tell you that there was something to it. Okay, I, I checked the situation for many years. Uh, most of the research on the matter was done by by myself, and there was something wrong. Something was really going on. You know, there were thousands of uh, uh, livestock that were killing many in very strange ways. You know, and uh, everything implied that what was going on was real. You know. So what's your theory on what happened to whatever was doing that? So say it's a creature of some sort, whether it was some kind of uh, weird psychological experiment or disinformation effort. Where did it go? Why did it go away? Well, I can tell you this, okay, uh, as a summary. Uh, it was real. Uh, there was a very strange creature involved with the, with the killings, you know, and not only one, uh, apparently several of them. But there was also some type of manipulation because in some cases, even though uh, flying saucer type crafts used to were seen in the same places at the same time where these attacks were occurring and the sightings of this creature were being made by, by the witnesses, in some cases, George, some of the crafts were being escorted by an apparent secret military personnel dressed in black in, in four by four vehicles, you know, and who, when were, they were discovered, also uh, always t- told the, the witnesses to leave the area because they were doing something with this craft and they, they didn't want to be uh, bothered with when they were doing whatever they were doing. So 
there some, seems to be some type of manipulation of the whole situation. Well, that, that isn't the first uh, time that's happened there or anywhere else, that's for sure. Same kind of stuff reported all over the world. Talk to me about the UFO picture on uh, your, your home, uh, Puerto Rico. It, the activity you were describing on that island where the Navy has done all that bombing, do you see the same kind of stuff flying in and out of the water these days as you saw for years? It continues to happen, okay? And uh, maybe you can you recall that back in 1996, uh, the, the NASA shuttle, okay, in mission STS-80, I believe it was, filmed several incidents up in space, okay, uh, in which they recorded these uh, UFOs all over the Earth, you know, in, in, in orbit. And there's one film made by the astronauts in which you see something coming up, up from the Earth, okay, out to space. Uh, at first they said that it was in the area of uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. But then uh, it was... Uh, Corrected the, the the information was corrected, and it was identified exactly as the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico. At the sun of the island, this object came out from the sea, flying up to the sky at five miles. Uh, five, excuse me, five hundred miles per second. When it got close to the space shuttle, it veered to the left and disappeared in deep in deep space very fast. Okay. Uh, you can see that in the recordings that have been made, you know, uh, STS-80 mission, and that was in Vieques. Last year, I was checking with uh, Google Earth that area, checking if I could find something that would let me see that there was something down there, and I went to the area uh, where you can see uh, undersea, okay? And I made some... Uh, Enlargement of the image in Google Earth of the area of Vieques on the southwest of Puerto Rico. When you enlarge the image, you can see that there's something there uh, south of the southwestern tip of Puerto Rico, southeastern, excuse me, southeastern tip of Puerto Rico, right uh, between the city of Ponce and, and, the, and the town of Patillas. And there's something very weird down there, very big. A very a, with a very geometric shape, okay, uh, that doesn't seem natural. It seems some type of uh, huge artificial structure, and beneath that, a little farther away, there are four uh, apparent structures in rectangular shape that form themselves a quadrangle, okay. That is not. No way that is natural, okay? It seems to be some type of uh, a structure artificially uh, uh, made by someone, by some intelligence. And also, a little farther to the north, you can see in the seafloor, okay, you can see something like a, a tunnel or a road that goes from that place up to the uh, continental shelf of the south of part of the island and connects to the area of the town of Ponce. But the thing is, George, that that area depicted where these things are is almost a third part of the island of Puerto Rico. It's something very huge, and I don't think that this was made maybe by the U.S. Navy or something like that. Well, what about that possibility? You've read uh, uh, a lot of the stuff about a secret space program, the speculation by a, mm -hmm. a lot of American UFO researchers that we've got our own flying saucers, that we've got things that can go into space, uh, that maybe we have a secret space program based somewhere. Could that be it? Well, I, I believe also that the U.S. has some type of technology that allows it to, to do this type of craft. They have maybe some type of uh, a secret fleet uh, but there's also uh, the real ones, I would say, the, the real alien-type crafts. And, for example, if you go to the rainforest here in Puerto Rico, the El Junta rainforest in the east of the island, uh, there, there have been for decades, for many decades, a very high activity there of UFOs and aliens. Many people have seen them. Uh, forestry service personnel who work there, policemen, uh, tourists, visitors in the area, people who live nearby, all, uh, surrounding all the area. Uh, 
There are mountains that open there, and UFOs come out from these places, flying saucer type crafts. Uh, there's even a phenomenon that I know will be of interest to you, George, because of the, your, uh, the job the, you did with the, uh, the incidents occurring in Utah. The Gorman uh, Ranch. Yeah, you, in Utah. The, the Skinwalker Ranch, right? The Skinwalker Ranch, that's correct. Uh, there's a, an area there between the mountains of El Junque and El Toro. Uh, in the rainforest that several people, many people have seen that opens, the matter, the surface disappears. A strange haze, a glow, a reddish-orange glow appears. Everything in that area, in that perimeter, disappears, and you can see a very, very big hole in the earth, okay? And down there, it has been described by policemen, by people from the uh, forestry service personnel. They see very far down, deep in, in underground, like a city, very illuminated, very bright. Okay. Hey, Jorge Martin, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing us this information with us. We put a link on the Coast to Coast site, a link to your blog spot if people want to read more about this, both in English and Spanish, the Castro story. And a lot more. Jorge, I hope you'll keep us posted on uh, whatever you're working on and come back and see us. Welcome back. I mentioned that the book, The Entity Letters, is one of the very best I've ever read based on one of the longest and most intriguing studies of spirit communication ever undertaken. Now, consider my mind blown all over again. Dr. James McLennan has put together an entertaining and scholarly examination of a wide range of what we, we might call paranormal or supernatural or religious events and phenomena, and uh, he is no armchair expert. Professor McLennan, a sociologist, has traveled the world to see these things for himself, including some absolutely harrowing experiences in places that most certainly qualify as haunted. The book Wondrous Events looks for common denominators and connections, similarities between events as reported by different cultures, even in different centuries. It's just a masterful piece of work. I'm so glad to have James McLennan back here. Great to have you here, James. Hey, it's good to hear you. Uh, you know, I hope I'm not going to embarrass you, but after diving into this book, A Wondrous Events, I gave, uh, you know, I wanted to say, you're you're something of a badass. I mean, this is not for the timid, the kind of things you did. You didn't just talk the talk. You definitely walked the walk, in particular, these haunt, haunted house events that we're going to get into a little bit later. Well, they're out there, that's for <laughs> sure. Um, wondrous Events, terrific title. It belies some of the really scary stuff that's in the book. How did you settle on that title? Well, there's a question as to really what's going on, and we don't really know. Uh, but there's a kind of a common feature that it stimulates wonderment. People just really, really wonder what's going on. So that's why I chose uh, the, the concept of wondrous events. Uh, when did it first came out? Come out? Because I, I was looking. I've been watching to see when you'd have something else come out, so I could invite you back. And I saw a publication date that said 2021, I thought, aha, here's a new one. But then I saw that it, an earlier version had been out. So when did you put this out? Well, this this book was published in 1994, Wonders oh. Events. Oh, so it's, it seems like it's more up to date. Have you, uh, have you added new material since then? Well, since then, I continued that whole line of research, and my second book is called Wondrous Healing. And that came out in 2002. I called this courageous not only because you were willing to kind of go into the belly of the beast yourself with some stories that we're going to get into, but also you were obviously aware of how much grief you'd probably take from skeptics, debunkers, other academics, people for whom this is all nonsense, and they know this without ever cracking open the book or reading past the title page. You kind of address them early on, uh, talking about how this is a sociological study, so you make no claims about physical causes for the events you describe. Um, I wonder if that worked with some of them. Well, it turns out it hasn't really worked all that <laughs> well. But, uh, you know, life goes on, and the same phenomena that happened all those years ago is still going on today. So the world keeps going around no matter what. Well, I like that attitude. But, I mean, um, you know, we look at some of the events that you describe, and you say it's a sociological study. You make no claims about physical causes. For these events. Uh, it's unlikely we could do that even if we wanted to. But what is done, I think, is that science is used to cross things off the list. They could say, well, this is not paranormal or supernatural because of X and Y. You do some of that yourself. 
uh, kind of showing that you're not totally gullible or fall- infallible and you, that you accept everything on face value. And the example I would use is the psychic surgeons. There's a chapter in the book about psychic surgeons. You wrote that you watched more than a thousand of them in person, and you even underwent one yourself. And in the end, you're pretty sure it's all sleight of hand, that it's not really what is uh, presented as real, right? Well, uh, you could you could reach that assumption. Uh, it's it's a part of the culture in the Philippines, and particularly north of Manila. But there's there's a there's there's kind of a mystical orientation. There's a lot of belief in among people in the Philippines. And so it's not just psychic surgery, but there's a lot of uh, kind of cultural phenomena going on there. And, and when they cut you, when the surgery was done on you, what did they? What, what, what kind of incision was made? And do you think they used a blade of some kind? Well, let's, let's just back up a little bit. Uh, I, I, was in the, I was in Asia and traveling around Asia with the University of Maryland Asia program as a college professor. So I found, and I was spending my time in visiting uh, indigenous psychic performers or paranormal performers because I was curious and so in the Philippines, that's what they have. They have psychic surgeons, and it's, it's quite, it isn't that difficult to locate the famous ones. So I was visiting every famous psychic surgeon that I could find. And then I, I ended up going in the back country and visiting just local people, too, uh, regular uh, you know, spiritualist services. And so, yes, it looks like they're doing a surgery, and the blood comes out, and they, they're pulling people's organs out of the body. and it's a it's an astonishing performance, but it's, it's the same kind of performance again and again. It looks very very similar again and again. And back when I was in the United States, I visited James Randi, who was active at that time, and uh, he could do psychic surgeries. It's, it's a it's, it's a sleight of it looks like a sleight of hand performance. Um, in this book, Wondrous Events, seems like you were addressing critics before they even had a chance to issue sort of very predictable kinds of attacks. Uh, I think the phrase you use is something like, whether these events really happened, as the witnesses describe, if the witnesses believe it happened, it's relevant for your purposes as a sociological uh, investigation, right? It's a sociological reality. It's, and, and you see it in every country, every, every country that you visit to encounter this type of thing. Now, uh, I, I spent four years in Asia, and I gathered notes, uh, page after page of notes, and when I got back to the United States, I was pondering what's the core feature in all this, because there's a great deal of difference between country to country. So they're interested in each other, but uh, psychic surgery, you find that in the Philippines and Okinawa, there's... Uh, Shamanic practitioners, they call them Utahs, and, uh, Taiwan, you know, they have their own indigenous practitioners, and uh, Thailand, s- same thing. So, uh, there's, you know, some are Christian, some are Buddhist. In India, you have Hindu perform- you know, performances. So I was wondering, what's the common feature to all this? And when I looked through my notes, it seemed like the individual experience, certain people have a propensity to have these kinds of experiences. Now, I wasn't, wasn't sure exactly what kind of list that these experiences might fall into or what kind of categories they might fall into. So then as I, when I got my first job as a professor in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, I was teaching anthropology, and I would have my students go out and just ask people in the community, if you've had an unusual experience, would you tell us about it? And they, I'd have them write down what the person said. We started collecting these cases. And it wasn't too many years before I had over 1,000 cases and then 2,000 and almost 3,000. And I found there's certain categories of spontaneous experience that people have. And some people are, have a very high propensity for these kinds of experiences. They have more than one. They have many. And those are the kinds of people who become shamanic practitioners or, or psychic practitioners and the kinds of experiences that they have fall in certain categories. I found that there's apparitions, paranormal dreams, waking extrasensory perception, psychokinesis, 
out-of-body experience, near-death experience, sleep paralysis, spiritual healing, then a category I called synchronicity, uh, and then also people see UFOs. And then there's another, I, I just had a, a miscellaneous category for everything I couldn't seem to categorize. And, and I found these kinds of experiences occur all over the world. But you have the same kinds of experiences no matter where you are. So there's, I, I, would, I would assume that this has something to do with human physiology. It must be related to, to uh, huh. probably human consciousness. Uh, you know, the skeptics, you write in the book that the, some of the people who reviewed it, colleagues who were critical of this, they, they wanted you to add the word alleged to the events that you're describing, the experiences. Just you call it an alleged experience because it maybe didn't really happen. And, you know, science scientists as gatekeepers, they decide what's scientific and what isn't. You make the argument that, you know, something that's considered folklore today can be scientific tomorrow. You know, rocks falling from the sky, and then we discover meteorites later. Hypnosis. Uh, really does work that we, you know, and who knows which of the events you describe in this book could be considered scientific a hundred years from now. Well, and also you can, you can devise hypotheses and, and do exper- sociological experiments with this kind of data. In other words, if you, if you encounter the same kind of experience in one country and another country and then a third country, then when you go to a fourth country, you can expect that you'll, counter that same kind of experience. Now, the, the frequency that people will report the experience will vary from country to country, but you, you find these kinds of experiences wherever you go. There's, there's people who have that type of experience. Uh, you, you did the, the international approach, Japan, China, the U.S., and these huge surveys that you did and other colleagues did, and you pull them all together. You're looking for evidence of cultural influence, right? To see whether there are commonalities and, and uh, similarities that would suggest that whatever is being reported here and elsewhere is not just the result of TVs and movie or some cultural influences of kids growing up in other countries and believing this stuff. Am I correct? Well, the first hypothesis that I was looking at was this notion that all the source of folklore and the source of folk religious belief is a product of culture. Because sociologists like to think like that. They like to think that culture is so very important that it determines the way that we think. That are, the way that we think is determined by what we've been told, and that if we have a certain belief, then that belief kind of manifests itself in a visionary experience. So I, I, was, uh, I encountered David Hufford's work uh, you know, about sleep paralysis, and, and he had devised this new argument which we refer to as experiential source theory. That, that theory is that the experience itself is the source of the folk belief. So people believe in, say, ghosts because they see them. They don't, the, 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 the counter-argument would be that people see ghosts because they believe in them. But when you start talking to people, you find that there's plenty of people who don't believe in ghosts but see them anyway. And there's even cases where more than one person sees the apparition or ghosts, and they see it simultaneously with other experiences. So there's reason why people believe it isn't just a, a sort, it isn't just the individual culture. And then when you go from culture to culture, there, there seems to be the same kind of experience, say the seeing of apparitions or what people refer to as ghosts in the English language. But the same kind of experience is occurring in all these countries. The surveys that you did, I mean, you started with a couple of thousand your students collected in the U.S., and then you or colleagues, you have surveys in U.S. and China and Japan. It's, it seems like a large number of people. And You ask them, what, different kinds of things about PK experiences, hauntings, ghosts, uh, deja vu, things of that sort? Well, we, I started off using kind of a standardized question that Greeley had used when he surveyed Americans long, you know, 1970s. We asked him about extrasensory uh, uh, contact with the dead and extrasensory perception. And uh, I, I think there's a deja vu question that he asked. And, and then I, I asked it, I had access to students, so I asked uh, random samples of college students at the University of Maryland, University of North Carolina Greensboro, Mississippi City State University, 
Can you give us the broad strokes of, of what you found, uh, the percentage of people who have these kind of experiences and how that compares around the world? Well, there's a lot of variation from country to country. And I found that uh, people in the United States are, have a pretty high higher probability of, of having these kinds of experiences than other people uh, in a lot of other places, particularly Europeans. But the most interesting finding happened in the People's Republic of China back in 1986 when I was there. I found a very high rate of Chinese students reported unusual experiences. And that was very surprising because these kids had all been raised as infants during the Cultural Revolution. And religious practices were totally banned during that time period. So it, was, it seemed that there was some kind of uh, you know, physiological situation going on uh, which might explain that. And I, and I think the, the, the problems of the Cultural Revolution probably caused childhood crises and difficulties. And that seems to be related to these kinds of experiences. People who, ha who have had difficult childhoods have a tendency to have more unusual experiences. Uh, what about Japan? Any uh, results from there that were surprising to you, that uh, were well, wildly different from here? And that, was, that, was, that went in the other direction. Japan is more of a secular society, and they seem to have a, they reported a lower rate of experiences, similar to the Europeans. Oh, that was one of the key points that you look at in this book, whether, you know, the assumption would be that people of faith would be more open to having supernatural kind of experiences around the world. What did you find on that particular question? Well, there wasn't that wasn't a strong relationship between religiosity and, and the anomalous experiences. But it, in fact, some scholars think that, that this type of thinking or belief in this kind of thing is is a kind of a replacement for a high level of religiosity. It's kind of like a secularized form of religiosity. But I'm, I'm, I'm not clear in my own mind exactly what the relationship is. There is, there is a, the, a, the kinds of experiences that people report are, there is a relationship to religiosity. In other words, people who believe in reincarnation have a higher probability of having reincarnation-type experiences People, for example, uh, Catholics might have a higher probability of having a near-death experience which involved purgatory or something that fit in with their beliefs, but, but many experiences uh, don't seem to fit with a person's previous religious belief. There's a kind of innovative quality to this whole thing. And what about the... I'm sorry. Spontaneous uh, quality. Right. Uh, one of the questions you ask, I can't remember where it is in the book, but whether or not science education would decrease the percentage of people who report these kinds of events. But I think one of the findings you had is with that people who with the scientific education are not necessarily immune from having them, right? Yes, I, I sent a questionnaire out to the, the elite members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and, and we found that there's a lower rate of unusual experience among this group, but a pretty high percentage of them have had an almost experiences and recognize that this is, doesn't fit in with the scientific culture, but they had the experiences anyway. And uh, the other unusual finding was that, he, that the scientists who are, who are highly educated or knowledgeable about the evidence regarding extrasensory perception, that wasn't leading to belief. The thing that seemed to be the the major factor that leads a person to believe is if they've had unusual experience. That leads to belief. If you've seen it, then you know that it's real. Um, I want to dive into hauntings and poltergeist cases. And you make a distinction that hauntings are more long-term kind of events, series of events, and poltergeists are kind of shorter in, in uh, the duration. Is that, that right? Yes. There's been experts who have, who have gathered a huge number of cases, and they find there's a tendency for these things to fall in those two categories, but there, there's a great deal of overlap. And, and in my case, okay, so then, you know, I do this uh, surveys and academic research, but then, uh, and then I also interacted with the parapsychologists of that day, and they started sending me cases of with people who had contacted them and saying, well, no, there's, in that time period, there weren't these ghost chasers like today. So they're saying, well, why don't you just find out 
what's going on. And so I, I was. I was contacting people and visiting haunted houses and just seeing what kinds of stories they would tell. And uh, <laughs> which I encountered, there's, there's plenty of hauntings, there's plenty of poltergeists, and there's plenty of cases which seem to fall in between. Well, and you experienced them. You were you were there and experienced them. I want to talk about a couple of them. There were 20 cases that you wrote about uh, in this book that you studied from 79 to 92. I, want, I don't know if you remember all the details, but let's start with the one in Baltimore. This is 1979. Nine people and the family members, they're seeing all this stuff. It's going on and on. They end up staying all, all nine go into one room, which seems to be the center of the activity and watch to stay awake all night to see if it happens. And it does. So then you come in and you stay in that room too. Can you describe what these, uh, the family was experiencing and what happened when you got there? Well, I was on the bed, which was thought to be the most haunted. And, uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, one of the daughters was on the other bed and a son was sleeping on the floor and another son was on the floor. We were all, we were just the younger people in the family. The, the old folks, they didn't want to stay up all night. So we were waiting, waiting, waiting. And uh, and then in the middle of the night, I saw a bright light on the wall, a red light. And I thought, well, that's that's the kind of thing which they described as being the, the haunting. You know? And then there's a real loud rap right beside my head. You know? It sounded like that very, very loud. And uh, I thought, well, that's, there it is. Okay. But, you know, I'm a skeptical person, or at least in those days, I certainly was. I was a very skeptical person. I thought, well, this, it's got to do something else besides that. This, you know, the light could just be coming in from the window and uh, maybe there's some kind of mouse or something, the wall or something like that. And then one of the sons started calling out. He was having a nightmare. And, uh, and, and, and I thought, well, this is some kind of show or something. It jumped up, and we turned on the lights, and it turns out that the blind was completely closed. There wasn't any way that the light could have gotten, come in from the outside. So, you know, I, I still remained a skeptical person at the time. I thought, well, maybe someone had shined the light from inside. Maybe someone they're trying to fool me. So we all, you know, back, went back to our positions, and I fell asleep. And then later on, about an hour and a half later, I woke up, and the bed was shaking. It's like some kind of earthquake was happening. And uh, I looked around the room, and nothing else was vibrating. It was just the bed, the bed that I was on. And I thought, well, maybe my heart's beating. Uh, maybe uh, my heart was beating pretty rapidly. It was an exciting experience. So I, I just thought, well, I'll take my pulse and see if that coincides with this vibration of the bed. And it wasn't. It, it, was, it was a different frequency. So that finally calmed down, and that was that was the experience that I had in that house. And that was that was something that those people were experiencing pretty frequently in those days. And how were they handling it? How was that family handling it with the, the you know, before you were there, had they had more dramatic uh, encounters or experiences? Many, with whatever many, it was? many yeah. dramatic encounters and seeing mist in the air and seeing apparitions and having sleep paralysis experiences and, and hearing voices. And it, it gives you insight into the kinds of things that, that people have as like experiences that they have. Now, they would they would have experiences simultaneously, but the voice would, would manifest for one person slightly different than for another person. So it gave me the impression that it has something to do with the individual consciousness and then also perhaps some kind of collective consciousness because they had the experiences simultaneously. Meaning that the people were somehow generating this themselves? Well, that's a theory, but and the people themselves, they were very curious about that. And they took all kinds of precautions, and they invited uh, religious practitioners in, you know, Catholic priests and Protestant preachers and uh, psychics trying to figure out what's going on. And there wasn't any consistency to any of the explanations, and it didn't seem to really help out. And so it just seemed uh, that over time they kind of, became more and more used to this phenomenon, and they just kind of adjusted to it. And I suspect there's people who are listening to this on the radio who are in a similar category. Uh, a lot of people are really, really disturbed. It just seems so very, very frightening. And so I would suggest just try to relax and 
realize that, that in general, these things aren't that harmful. And the fear seems to, to make it more difficult than if you're not afraid. And so if you could just kind of help yourself uh, reach a calmer state, you'll be better off. So just kind of get used to having a roommate that you can't see. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Um, you, in one survey that was conducted, uh, I think it, it was showed that about 10% of Americans believe they've had a haunting or poltergeist type experience. Yes. And, and that's a fairly about 10% or, but even a higher percent seem to have had the impression they've been in contact with a, a deceased person. That's very common. common um, there was common experience. The problem with a, the most common type is a paranormal dream. I would describe that. Well, people have a dream, and then they find out that the most common type of, of paranormal dream is a, 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 a dream of some event occurs that, that occurs in the future. So a person has a dream, and then suddenly or later on they find that that event, is, they're, they're in the dream, but it's happened exactly as they dreamed it. Um, I, I want to ask you about this Alexandria haunting. Because it sounded like, from what you wrote, the family there was kind of messed up about this thing. They were really spooked. Can you describe what was going on in the house, what, what had the family had reported seeing, and then whatever uh, experience you may have had? Well, they, they were having a lot of haunting-type phenomena, and they had contacted the Psychical Research Institute, and then they had got in touch with me. So I, I used to go out there about once a week just to talk with them and find out how things were going. And... Uh, they were seeing uh, mists in the kitchen, and the fire alarm was going off in the house, and uh, the uh, glass was breaking, and this was going on for week after week. And so we did a kind of experiment and had like a little party and tried to invite the, the ghosts to come. And I don't think we were really that successful, but that seemed to help out. The phenomena then declined, seemed to, be, seemed to decline. Uh, they had to, they had discovered that a previous woman who had lived in the house had committed suicide. So the thought was that well, that was her spirit was coming back and haunting the place. But uh, and as time passed, it was they were very comfortable with this. They, but uh, I, that was in those days. I, I came to the realization there's a tendency for for one person to have more experiences than everyone else, and so that that person might be considered the core person in the phenomena. And, and without, if that person leaves the, the scene, then the phenomena tends to decline. So that, that's a hypothesis that this kind of thing originates with an individual. So that could be the case, and it, but it also could be the case that there's some kind of spirit in the house too. There's not really a way of resolving that problem. Now, this particular case, I was up at, uh, uh, working up in Wisconsin, and I was contacted that the house, the phenomenon had, had pretty much disappeared, but then it suddenly flared up again, and the house caught on fire, and, and two of the people lost their lives. So that led to a National Enquirer headline of the case. It said, Ghost Kills Couple. You know, and, uh, oh. the, yeah, you don't, I guess for, but, I guess a guy like you doesn't want to really find yourself in a headline in the National Enquirer. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a shock, but uh, you know that that was what happened. And I I interviewed some of the people who were involved, and uh, it it seems probable that somebody accidentally started the fire in the in the kitchen, and it was, the fire probably had a normal origin. But at the same time, when I look back at my notes, the Fire alarms had been going off, and they had been seeing smoke in the kitchen. So that it's as if the phenomena had given them some kind of a, a warning that this might happen. It, it's, it was strange to look back at it. I know at one point you had uh, you were looking at Hong Kong hauntings in Hong Kong. How do they compare? Well, my friend Charles Emmons uh, was living in Hong Kong and gathered all these cases, and he found there there seemed to be just a normal. There's, there's unusual features with regard to these types of perceptions. It's, a, it's kind of like a distorted forms of perceptions. And those Hong Kong haunting cases were very similar to ones we see in America and to the Great Britain uh, cases that they gathered in the 1800s even. So there's a very 
commonality in parallel features. So I, I would argue there's probably some type of physiological basis for this kind of thing, for this kind of experience. Uh, there's another haunting uh, case that you personally investigated involving a military police station. I think I don't think we have enough time to get into that, but that's we'll jump into that one when we come back. And then uh, I want to talk about sleep paralysis a little bit. As you describe it in the book, I mean, it's one of the most terrifying phenomena that people ever say they've ever had. They're awake, they're, they're aware, and they can't move. Um, that's pretty spooky, and anybody who's had it um, knows how spooky it can be and how unsettling it can be. And welcome back to Coast to Coast on a Sunday night. George Nori with you. Wallace Wagner Jr. received his Bachelor of Science degree from West Virginia University. That was back in 1981. Subsequently did graduate work at Marshall University and the University of Charleston. He gained a very unique understanding of the Bible from at least 40 years of study, mostly self-taught. And he had an interest in UFOs, crafts in the Bible, prophecy, the Great Pyramid of Giza, disclosure, everything we talk about on the program. In 2016, he had his own UFO sighting of the white Tic Tac variety that we've talked about on the program. His book is called Crossing the Crevice. It's an amazing book, including the stories about uh, Moses, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and some other incredible stories. Wallace, welcome to the program, first of all. Well, thank you, George. I'm happy to be here. And great job on the book, by the way. For for someone who was getting into this field, you did a heck of a job, my friend. Well, thank you very much. I, I did put forth quite a bit of effort. You sure did. Tell me a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into your work. Sure. I was born and raised in a little town in West Virginia called Logan. It's a coal mining town. It's in southern West Virginia. I now live in Bedford, Virginia. Uh, with my wife of 24 years. Oh, good for you. And um, I call myself an ecumenical Christian these days. And explain that to folks who may not be that that religious. Well, I can go to any church I want to. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, That's fair enough. I'm a basic Christian, and uh, I have been Southern Baptist and Methodist before, but um, that was in the past. How did your interest in UFOs start? Well, I, I guess I grew up with with uh, a mother that was really interested in them, and uh, we watched all the science fiction movies as I grew up. So I've always I've always uh, been interested. But when I saw my own UFO, it changed everything. I bet. You and I might be brothers, because my mother's the one who got me into UFOs at a young age, too. (laughs) They like that. She brought me home a book by Walter Sullivan, who was the New York Times science writer at the time. He wrote a book called We Are Not Alone, and it just fascinated me about the probability that uh, we are not alone. And then uh, a year or two later, Look Magazine came out with the story of Barney and Betty Hill, the abduction case out in oh, New yes, Hampshire. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. And I just, oh, man, I just couldn't get enough of this. And I said, I'm going into broadcasting. I'm going to cover these stories. This is what I want to do. And doggone it, that's, that's what I did. Tell us about the Crossing the Crevice. Tell us about the title. Well, it, it, it's, it, it's a, an attempt, let's put it that way, to... Get a group of people, namely people that take their Bible extremely literally, and move them to a place where they can accept a more um, open interpretation of of what's in the book. And uh, I cover a lot of topics. You do. uh, You sure do. uh, Actually, the book was getting too long, so I had to cut it off. (laughs) It it is, by the way... It is a big book, too. Yes, yes, it is. And thank you for the little inscription in there, too. I appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome. Now, well, let's talk about your UFO case, because that leads us into the book. What happened to you back in 2016? Well, at the time, George, I was a mailman. And I had just made a delivery here in Bedford County. Okay. And... Um, I put a package under a carport, and as I was going back to my Jeep, something told me to stop and look up. Daytime, that's too, the, I guess, right? That's exactly what I did. I'm standing in this lady's yard, and uh, I'm looking up in the air, and right over my head is this craft. Now, I've been taught 
by a, a, a teacher at Liberty University to call them crafts. Okay. Not UFOs. They they use the word crafts because it's less threatening. But um, here here is this large, maybe 55 feet long craft, maybe 30 feet wide, right over my head, and it's gleaming white, and it, it appeared to be solid. Clearly, so, clearly not an airplane. Oh no, not an airplane at all. This, this looked like a white. Tic Tac Mint. Uh, there were no wings, no nacelles, no exhaust, no windows or ports. It was solid. Was it floating, flying? What was it doing? It was stationary. All right. I saw it for about two and a half, maybe three seconds. And did you keep peering at it while it's saying, oh, this must be a huge balloon or something like that? Oh, well, let me tell you, everything you can imagine went through my mind yeah. after I got home. Um, I thought I thought maybe it was a blimp. Maybe it was Google taking pictures. Uh, you know, just mm-hmm. all kinds of things went through my mind. And I actually thought, did they want me to see it? Maybe it was a malfunction. How did it disappear? I'm, I'm always curious how they take off. You know, George... I don't know whether it disappeared or cloaked or took off so fast that I simply didn't see it. It just was it gone was like in a blink of an eye. For me to know what I saw, and then it was gone. It either cloaked or it took off so fast that uh, it was in between the blink of an eye. Now, when you got home, Wallace, did you turn on your local television news? Did they have any reports of UFO sightings going on that day or anything like that? No, sir. Nothing. Nothing. Did you report it? No. How come? I, uh, of course, talked to my wife about it, and uh, I mentioned it to my Sunday school class and just some family members and let it boil for a while. Included in your book, Crossing the Crevice, is your experience, of course, because you have been to Egypt and Israel. You've looked at the pyramids of Giza. Tell me your thoughts about that. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm one of those believers that the pyramid is a lot older than we've been taught. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. I did get inside, and I had a little square with me. They confiscated my camera. but uh, Oh, they did? <laughs> no pictures, no, really? No pictures for me. Not that day. Jeez. But uh, I did get in with a square, and let me tell you, it is exact. The sarcophagus is is exact. And on the back side of the sarcophagus are several holes, and I could stick my finger in one of those holes, and there's about a three-eighths of an inch lip, which tells me that was an awfully powerful drill to have been a copper drilling into granite. And when you look at it, don't you wonder how in the heck did this thing get built? Oh, of course. It, it, it's astounding, and, that, and that's, that's an understatement. Uh, it's just it just blows your mind away, and to think it was covered in white limestone that was so perfectly placed that you couldn't even see the door to get in. Any thoughts on how they built it? In your opinion? Well, if if you go back twenty or thirty thousand years, I'm going to say it would be the sky gods that built it. You might be right. I know Zahi Zahi Hawasu. Used to head up Egypt's uh, antiquities before he got overthrown when Mubarak got dumped. Right. Uh, he still hangs around out there. But, gosh, you talk to him about the possibility of E.T. involvement in, in, the, in the pyramids. He goes crazy because <laughs> he wants the Egyptians to be known well, that they built it. That's exactly what happens. I, I was over there for a week, and, and uh, you talk to the guides and, and everybody there, and they lead you to believe that, you know, we started out with a pile of rocks, and then we ease into the step pyramid, and then we ease into the bent pyramid, and every pharaoh wants to outdo the previous one. <laughs> then we ended up with Khufu. Well, guess what happens some 70 years after Khufu? We're back to a pile of rocks again. Exactly. I think these guides have been told, Wallace, you do not deter from any other story other than we made these pyramids 
or we're going to get you. I think they put, exactly the, right. yeah, they put the scare of God in them, to be sure. I kind of follow Dr. Robert Schultz. Schultz Shock, as yeah. As well, yes, sir. And, uh, right. you know, he, he did some studies with, with the erosion and whatnot, and uh, he kind of feels they're at least 10,000 years old. Well, there's, 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 a, there's a lot there, much more than that, which does make you wonder when you tie it into your book, Crossing the Crevice, all the very strange things that uh, that may be going on. You have looked at the Bible, and uh, because you're multi-denominational, and you've looked at all kinds of religions, what do you think of the Bible? And then we'll get into the Bible's perspective of the craft, so to speak. I'm looking forward to that. It's, uh, in, in, in my opinion, the biblical is a historical book, to be sure, but you have to interpret it. What do you think? Well, it is a book of books, and a lot of people look at it as just being one book, so therefore everything in it is correct. Right. And it's still a term from uh, Reverend Michael Carter, uh, the gatekeepers of Christianity— you know, kind of sort of have an agenda, and everybody follows that agenda. Well, I'm kind of breaking the mold. I'm not following that agenda. Uh, th- there's absolutely no way that that book is inerrant. Uh, there's a, quite a few problems, and uh, if we have time, we'll certainly discuss those. Yeah, we've got a, we've got about a minute or two before the break. Go ahead. Um, if 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 you Know where to look. It's full of errors. And, and I'm not going to become a Bible basher here on the air. But, no, uh, I, I know it. There's a place in Matthew uh, that refers to Jeremiah, when in fact it's not Jeremiah at all. It's actually Zechariah. And isn't it conceivable? That's in every translation. Isn't it conceivable when they talk about fallen angels, the Nephilim, and all these other aspects, that they're talking about extraterrestrials who came down to this planet? Well, that's what I believe, and I believe it is scattered throughout the Bible, and I believe it's mostly often overlooked. It's not what the teachers... Uh, want to teach, and uh, it's certainly not part of the agenda to keep everybody together. And, and you know, I think they're they're afraid to teach that. Well, that that might very well be, but it's still in there. So, you know, if pe- they want people to read their Bible, and if you read it, you're going to come across it, and now you're going to wonder, well, why didn't they ever mention it? Exactly. Well, I tell you what, if you're going to talk about the Nephilim. That's going to take a whole show. (laughs) We'll have to have you back again. Well, I'd be glad to come back. If you want answers on the Nephilim and giants, I don't believe you're going to find it in in any of the translations. In my book, I stick with the King James, the NIV, Mm -hmm. the New American Standard, and then the Living Bible, which is one of the loose translations that's kind of popular today. And they're all over the board. I mean, some some translations like the King James don't even mention Nephilim. And uh, you're left believing that it's either the sons of God that came down and impregnated the beautiful women, and then their offspring were giants, or something completely different, like um, the Nephilim were were there before and then there afterwards, which they're basically given a pass for the flood, which 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 in itself is a contradiction because in Genesis chapter seven we're told that everything was killed, and uh, uh, we have no more mention of these people from space coming down again, with just the eight people left alive on the world in the world. So you're, you're left to come up with your own conclusion. And do you think the interpretation of the Bible is uh, subjected to a lot of different people? Yes. I believe that the interpretation 
basically is to keep everybody in line. There's, there's an agenda, and we'll follow the agenda. You know, whether you have someone that go, uses electionary or, or something like that, it's all watered down to keep everybody together and in tune. They don't deviate too far from the given agenda. Let's talk about some biblical UFO type stories and encounters. What do we have out there, Wallace? Well, I tell you what, George, the Bible's full of them. Uh, it helps to establish a little bit of groundwork okay. initially. And that's with three words stars, spirits, and glory. The latter of which uh, most expositors would say is the hardest word to decipher, it has the most meanings. We run into a little bit of a problem that the Hebrew language only had about 7,000 words in it, and you compare that with what we have in our English language today, which is somewhere north of 170,000 words, and you come to realize that those three words have multiple meaning, meanings. The Hebrew word for stars is ector. The Hebrew word for spirits is rosh, and for glory, it's kabod. And if you take those three words and have an open mind, the Bible is going to open up for you. Let's start with some Old Testament encounters. We talked about perhaps a cloaked tic-tac, mm-hmm. is what I saw. Well, there's an event where there were cloaked crafts in the Bible. We found that in Second Kings, and it's with Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And this story has Elisha's servant not seeing horses and chariots of fire in the air until Elisha prayed to God to open his eyes. Mm -hmm. And then what the servant saw, now get this, were horses and chariots of fire coming down to encircle Elisha. In other words, they were there all along. And normal people like you and me could not see them, but they beckoned to Elisha's call. And I'm hoping that uh, we can agree that chariots of fire, that's pretty much a give me. That sounds like a craft. (laughs) You got it. (laughs) That sounds like And here's a real good example. It's found in Judges 5. It's the Song of Deborah, or your Bible may say the Song of Deborah and Barak. It goes kind of like this. The mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. And the stars fought in heaven. And we know that stars don't fight. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. Curse Miraz, said the angel of the Lord, because they did not come and help the Lord. Well, let's just stop right there. Most people today, Bible experts, if you will, say that Miraz was a city in and around the Galilee area. And this is, this is a place where the teachers and writers kind of scratch their head and try to make these verses non-threatening to go along with the agenda. Now, if Meroz, and that's spelled M-E-R-O-Z, was a city, how could they fly up to heaven to help the Lord? <laughs> they didn't have spaceships. And, and why does the Lord need help anyway? And by the way, everything we're talking about tonight, as the Catholic Church would say, does not negate one's belief in God. That is correct. That's important for everybody to understand that. That is correct. This, this whole passage only makes sense if you realize the Lord is not omni-everything. And that's, that's, that's another topic we could have a whole show on. He flies in a craft. That's mentioned in Psalms as well. And these crafts appear as stars at night. So the only way this passage makes sense, George, is if Miraz is a planet. And okay. inhabitants of the planet Miraz must have been an advanced race, and they did not go to heaven to help the Lord. And what, what's more is the Jewish Talmud indicates Miraz is a planet. And if you were a human witnessing things from space, you would put biblical context into it, because that's all you understood. Exactly. Exactly. 
And there, there's there's so many more. Um, Did you look at Ezekiel's wheel? Oh yes, that's yeah, another that, great that, case. That that's that one's a pretty common one. And uh, what about been proven? What, what, yeah, what, go ahead. What about Fatima? When the sun came down, I think it could have been a UFO that came down. Well, I agree. I've been to Fatima, and uh, I do agree that uh, that was a UFO or a, or a craft. But let's talk about. Zachariah. All right. He saw a flying scroll. Scrolls don't fly, as we know. It was about 30 feet by 15 feet, kind of a cigar-shaped craft. And we have had cigar-shaped UFOs. You got it. But this event has more meaning. It's kind of in Chapter 6. He looks up again, and he sees two mountains made of bronze. Now, mountains are not made of bronze, and these are up in the air. But now he sees chariots coming out of them. And here's something that's really interesting. We are actually told that those chariots are spirits. And that's a point I want to get across, that spirits or spirit can also mean a craft, just like stars. So that that's one place we're told that the chariots, are actually spirits. That's fascinating. I mean, when you, when you look at the possibilities, it's right out there, right under your nose, isn't it? Oh yes. You got you. You have to do your own study to find it because you're not going to be taught that. Could you, you imagine? Kn- could you imagine being told that from behind the pulpit? Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you not, got not, that right. not like that. Do you know Doctor Barry Downing? Or have I you do. heard of him? I have, I have both of his books. Yeah, he, he's another one who believes in the biblical tie-in and correlation with extraterrestrials and UFOs. That is correct. I, I wish I would have read his book back in the 60s, and I didn't. I, I got latched on to Chariots of the Gods by, by Von Dannigan, and I could not put that book down until I completely finished it. You devoted about a chapter to the 6,000-year-old theory of planet Earth. Tell me about that. Well, there's absolutely positively, in my humble opinion, no way the Earth is 6,000 years old. Here, here. I've got a lot, uh, I've got a lot of friends around here that, that, you know, believe that because that's what they're taught and that's what the Bible says. But um, I, I get into a lot of things in my book, like such as coal and salt and uh, the Palermo Stone, the Turin uh, papyrus, uh, and just so many things. Um, you, you study all this stuff from all these different sources, and they all point to the Earth being much older than 6,000 years. And uh, I fully believe that. And I'm also a believer in carbon-14 dating. I, I know mm-hmm. it has its proponents and naysayers, but Basically, it does work up to about 50,000 years. And, you know, we only need to go back eight or 12,000 years to know that it's longer than 6,000. And I put a lot of examples of that uh, in the book. Well, yeah, there's no question. It's 4.5 billion years old. I believe in science when it comes to this, to be well, of sure. Of course. And I, I do as well. With with the Bible, do you think these stories that were put in there were eyewitness accounts? What do you think they were, Wallace? I believe that they were eyewitness accounts. They just did not know what they were seeing, and they had limited vocabulary. And uh, they just did the best they could do. Yeah, I think so, too. Something I mean, very dramatic happened on this planet a couple thousand years ago, uh, during the you know beginning of religion and Christianity and everything else, something just truly magnificent happened. You think it was specific that they did it for a reason? The visitations? It could very well be. I believe that we've had help all along, and I believe that we've never been alone, and we're not alone right now. So I love the. Uh, the quote from the movie Contact, where the extraterrestrial was talking to Jodie Foster, Ellie, and in essence telling her 
they're looking for what we're looking for, and that is who created us, how were we created, what are we doing here? They're all looking for the same thing. That could very well be. That could very well be. Um, I'll throw this out. That uh, I mentioned the Talmud. It, the Talmud mentions, the Jewish Talmud mentions that God flies around at night because he has 18,000 planets to observe. I think about that. Yep, that's, that is awesome to be sure. You have got a quote in your book from the late Ben Rich, the former head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. And I'm going to read a little bit of that quote and get your reaction to it, Wallace. And Ben said years ago, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine we already know and already do. What do you think of those comments? I love Ben Rich. I have his book from the Lockheed Skunk Works, and I believe it's truthful. He also made another comment that that, uh, goes right in hand with that, and it goes something like this. There was an error in the equation, and we know how to travel to the stars. This was back in 1993, George. Jeez. And here we are close to 30 years after that. And and you go back to the original Star Trek, you know, that came on in 1966. Yep. You had handheld communicators, warp, fax machines. Warp speed. CDs, warp speed, cassette tapes, talking computers. And here we are today. So can you imagine 30 years from now? All we need is beam me up, Scotty, and we got it all. Well, we're working on that now. And uh, as I understand it, we are able to transport very small particles, but we've got still a long way to go with that. Do you remember the cartoon, The Jetsons, a long time ago when we were kids? I do. That was one of my favorites. And I believe that's where we're heading. Flat screens on, on walls. You got that it. were televisions. And we looked at that going, that's, that's crazy. I, you know, that, that's too thin to be put on a wall to be a television. And look, look at And even Dick Tracy, ta- the talking watch and stuff like that. It's all here. It's all here. And I'll, I'll tell you something else. Um, ben Rich also said, whatever you can think of. We've already done, and that's, I mean, I don't know how you can go beyond that. We're going to take calls with Wallace Wagner next hour here as we're talking about his work, Crossing the Crevice. Uh, you're aware of Stephen Greer, obviously. He's been on our show many times. He's, he's one of the two people I follow pretty closely. And what do you think about disclosure? Uh, when do you think it's going to happen? Well, I think you and I are old enough that... I don't think formal disclosure will happen in our lifetime. I've always said that. Um, we might get bits and pieces. Now, if there's a, a, a or, worldwide upheaval... Or some whistleblower. That may change things. Um, I'm, one of, I'm one of those people that, that kind of sort of believe in the back of my mind that even if we have disclosure, it may be a false flag event. To trick us? You got it honestly believe that one would have thought years ago nah they'll never do that to us but this now that you look at things that are happening on this planet i think they take advantage of us any way they could well i'm not sure take it would be taking advantage it would really just be an effort to pull the world back to some kind of semblance or to order where do people get your book crossing the crevice uh it's on, available on amazon in kindle Grayscale or color. Super. It's All a, three. It's great. And you've got some great uh, pictures there that you've sent us that Lex has posted at coasttocoastam.com as well. Well done there. Thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. 